This episode of Primary and Secondary Modcast is brought to you by Nighthawk Custom Firearms. Out of the box with upgrades you need, ready for carry, duty, or combat. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. This is Modcast number 100. We are talking about the AR-15 theory today. Basically everything about the AR-15. Um, everything from upkeep and maintenance to various uh, the projectiles, twist rates, maybe even the barrel linings. We'll see. Um, awesome panel tonight. I think this is going to be fun. At least, I, I don't know about the panel. I don't know if they're going to have any fun. I'm going to have fun. Um, my background's in law enforcement. Um, now doing the social media thing a lot more. It's enjoyable. I like it. It's fun to be able to reach out and be able to positively influence others. Um, in primary and secondary news, we do we did just start, and I'll even pull it up on my computer here. Uh, we just started a new little feature on the primaryandsecondary.com website. If you go to primaryandsecondary.com, there is a menu on the left-hand side. On that menu, the second thing down is a training calendar. Basically what I'm doing is I'm reaching out to all kinds of instructors, uh, people within our network, people outside of our network, and looking to just compile information for everyone. No fees, no fees for this. This is just something, I, I just wanna be able to provide a resource for training for, for anyone that's interested. Uh, the link immediately under training events is the training venue map. Here's the idea behind this. Uh, let's say you're going to one of these courses and you don't know how to get there. What do you know? We have this venue map right here where it provides a link how to get there. Uh, it can give directions. It gives you the website address. Also gives you uh, links to every single course that we have in our system uh, that's being hosted at that facility. So a couple resources for everyone out there. Uh, this has actually been something that I've been hoping to actually implement for quite some time. And it's really cool to be able to provide this now for, for everyone, primary and secondary person or non-primary and secondary person. It doesn't matter because this stuff is important. So let's see here. Might as well do some intro things. Okay. In the meantime, we can go to Mike. I appreciate you having me back. Uh, Mike Lewis, military background, uh, spent 20 years in the infantry about 10 of them in the 82nd Airborne Division. My last posting was the 82nd Airborne Division Master Gunner. I've been doing training on the civilian side for about a decade, as previously discussed in the last couple of modcasts. You know, in retirement, I took took a little bit of time to get situated and uh, getting ready to get spun back up. Cool. Uh, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I'm billed from Carnicon, but uh, I think for the purposes of tonight, uh, it's going to be more my actual professional background in design and manufacturing of uh, particularly uh, AR-15 parts and related stoner systems, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I did that for six years at uh, CMMG and have continued to kind of stay in the business a little bit, just a little lower profile. Um, so that's where I'll be chiming in is from the uh, – manufacturing and uh, kind of guru spot. Cool. Carl. Hey guys, I uh, run in range TV and sometimes collaborate with Ian on forgotten weapons. Ian is also a part of course, part of in range TV as well. Uh, in range TV focuses more on modern equipment, but through a historical lens, uh, also an avid competition shooter across the board, NRA high power run the two gun match here in Tucson for 10 years plus as well as a civilian training junkie. So hopefully I can bring something to the table tonight. I believe so. Ray. Ray Miller, uh, current E second master gunner, um, 20 years in the army. Uh, you know, I'm trying to improve my organization both through training and uh, force models out of us. So really interested to see what you as a panel have to say about weapons questions and trying to get further knowledge on the system as a whole just to make sure I'm giving my command good knowledge on what weapon systems are, are better. Calvin. 14. Hey 
Hi, I'm Calvin. Uh, so you guys might know me as a book long, but today I am just myself. Um, I've been working a lot on how to get like how to get it. Ah, I've been working a lot on uh, getting myself killed in the streets by doing a lot of competition shooting, and um, you know I'm a self-proclaimed gun nerd. Been reading about guns since I was a child, so here I am, and uh, I've got some rounds from the AR-15. So why the heck not? That's right. And you recently had a class. Yes, recently took a class from JJ Rakaza, um, you know, multi-world champion, multinational, uh, open division, I think limited division as well, shooter. And uh, I mean, he's just a phenomenal guy. For someone who puts very few rounds down range per year, uh, I mean, he's just the way he can do is unbelievable. So if you have a chance, check it out. I paid for the class myself, it's not sponsored or anything. Um, and it was definitely worth it. Cool. Chuck, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my, my bandwidth sucks. Um, everybody's audio is cutting in and out. So I switched to my phone. Um, Chuck Pressburg, retired 26-year Army uh, soft veteran. Uh, current consultant to the industry and firearms trainer. Not to mention you're an action figure. Yes. Ha. Ah. They were actually going to name that guy Chuck Blowers. I'm not kidding. <laughs> we had to get them to stop that. That would have been awesome. And he's right here too. Cool. Um, before we went live, we discussed a little bit about uh, what, the topic, what the topics potentially are going to be. Um, it's going to be kind of sad for some people watching because it sounds like the panel is really on the same page with pretty much all of this. So you know, there's going to be a lot of head nodding and going, yep, yep. Uh, and, and some people are going to be pulling out their hair that are listening because we're probably going to be presenting some concepts that they don't necessarily agree with. Um, hopefully, though, and this is something that I've been saying recently, through, through disagreements, we can learn other perspectives and we can learn more. So uh, please consider what's being discussed. Uh, obviously, none of this is, is law, but this is, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a good conversation. Mike, I think it might not be a bad idea to start with what you, what you were discussing and just get that right out of the, out of the way. Okay, you're talking the maintenance piece? Yep. Okay. <laughs> How do we go? Let's see. My military career, um, I shudder to think before, you know, somebody taught me better how many guns I potentially damaged doing maintenance because, you know, the military does it. Uh, police departments, I can't tell you for sure if they do it, but I would assume so after training days. There's a lot of people out of here in the civilian side. Every time you shoot your gun, you need to clean your gun, blah, 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 blah. To the point where in the military, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on myself right now, and I want to punch myself in the face for doing it. I have seen and taken part of, you know, white glove inspections before it gets turned in this and that and the other people putting brake cleaner, carburetor cleaner, simple green and guns. The inside of the compensator has to be clean. So you take a, a steel cleaning rod section and scrape out the inside of the compensator. Yeah, that's the crown. And it's stupid. You know, my gun before I retired at work, I, I, I'd gotten... I'd gotten to the point where, you know, I had a position that I could kind of get away with things and I would clean my gun to what they call a level one maintenance, dust, rust, major carbon. It's clean. It's operational. It's good. Here, arms room monkey, take my gun, put it in the rack. If the fucking commander has a problem, tell the fucking commander to come see me directly and I will tell the fucking commander I'm not damaging the guns because they want a white glove inspection. When it comes time to gauge the guns, yes, we'll clean them to that standard. But until then, no, we're damaging guns. And if you if if I pull my gun out from downstairs right now, it's it's filthy. You know, my maintenance is I pull the bolt carrier group out, I relube it, whether I wipe it down or not, it depends on the day. I put it back in, it continues to shoot like a porn star. I don't care when it when it malfunctions. Then I'll clean it. 
but you know cleaning to me if you clean it is solely to get the shit off of it so you can inspect it for serviceability and that if it still works why are you going to go beyond that with okay, the exception of specific precision requirements, I was going to say, this is your AR-15 cleaning kit. A rag, and a bottle of lube, and I'm not even showing you what lube it is because I don't want to get into that fight because I don't <laughs> care. Bottle of lube and a rag. How does it taste? Um, I've cooked with some before, uh, but take out the bulk care group, wipe it down, re-lubricate it, put it back in, continue to shoot. Rinse, repeat. So I got, no. a, I got a question for three of the panelists. Chuck, Mike, Ray, how many years in the military do you guys have? I know Chuck's uh, 26. Ray? We're probably looking at 66. I got 20. Okay. So, 20. Yeah. Okay. So we have 66 years of experience. Do you, in your guys' opinion, in the military, and I have no military background. My background is purely law enforcement. Do you think the, the reason the uh, military weapons were maintained the way they were was it to keep things clean or to learn some kind of higher lesson? Uh, you know, I've funny you mentioned that I was actually talking to one of the warrant officers who runs logistics. Um, and cause I was looking at the system that we saw at shot show, uh, the weapon logic system, which it's a little plug that sits in the, the, uh, you can just put it anywhere on the weapon and it'll sit there and record the recoil impulse and tell symptoms of the weapon so you can do proactive maintenance long story short well he brought up something to the the first representative from weapon logic you know, we we don't do maintenance in a proactive sense in the military um mostly due to it's a cyclical maintenance so it's it's biannual you will gauge your weapons um and that's so that we can sit there and justify keeping our maintainers on staff. Because if we don't, and they sit there and do parts on a as-needed basis, Congress will sit there and be like, well, you've got X number of guys who are just sitting around on a daily basis not doing anything. Why do you need all these people? Even though we, we have a combat mission that may not reflect what's going on in peacetime. So, so from that standpoint, that's what the logisticians use to justify potentially doing long maintenance that way. Um, now, my question for the panel is, because Mike brought this up, there's myths out there, I think, in the military that you have to clean the weapon to that level. Like he brought up uh, gauging. We have arrows to check for wear and throat erosion and all that fun stuff. Do they really need to be that clean in order to be checked? Number one. And number two, I've always heard copper fouling is going to just destroy your barrel. Is this true? Yes or no? I, I would think one thing, I'm not going to answer those directly right this minute, but I think one thing we should clarify to the audience that's watching or will watch, that there's a difference between cleaning and maintenance, right? Cleaning is keeping the gun cleaned and lubed. Maintenance is checking spring tension, uh, chamber checks, all that kind of stuff. There's a difference there, and I think that some people confuse those two. Uh, well, agree. Right um, sorry, Ray, go ahead. Well, and like I was saying, the way that they, they check the barrel is they have gauges set up um, that basically it's it's a tapered machine rod that goes down the barrel, as I understand. But the problem is right now they're having to remake the gauges based off of our new ammunition. So... The calibration standard, I guess you could say, is for what's acceptable wear on the barrels is, is still being established based off that new ammunition we've gotten. Some, I'll, I'll speak to some of the gauging and, and whatnot. Um, the, the trick with the gauging um, is it needs to be basically as clean as it was designed to be uh, for that particular gauge, right? So you're like your throat erosion gauge, you know, uh, if they want it, you know, it's assumed that it's kind of that white glove level on the barrels. And I, my, my gut feeling says that's, that's probably about where, what it needs to be for that sort of, uh, gauging because, um, that's a pretty precise thing and any dirt or excess fouling there is going to really give you false results. Um, so there's that, but you know, uh, in any sort of gauging process, it's probably best to seed to 
whatever uh, the procedure is for for gauging something, and most of the time that's 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 going to be number one is is make sure you know it's clean and free of debris or any bullshit that's gonna that's gonna mess with that gauge. Um, and second to the the copper fouling. Copper fouling to a point will, you know, make your bullets come out sideways eventually. Um, in the meantime, it's it's probably best for the barrel end accuracy to kind of let some of that lay um, without uh, really scrubbing on it all the time. A little buildup's not going to hurt a thing. Um, and it's one of those things, it's, it's, it's about striking that balance between, okay, a little buildup there is actually probably good and is good for barrel life. Um, but then there's a point where it's too much and we're looking at pressure issues, uh, excess uh, and accuracy issues, and this bullet's coming out sideways. Um, and yeah, so that's, you know, it's not a thousand rounds, but it's not, it's, you know, it may be in that 10,000 round mark. Uh, not saying, you know, you shouldn't run a boar snake through that stuff to get out any crud or debris, but that, uh, you know, spending a half hour throwing, you know, a hundred patches hops down the bore is probably, probably, you know, kind of a once or twice in a barrel's lifespan sort of deal. Well, I think I touched on this earlier, but there's a big difference between a precision setup and just a, a rifle, right? Because if you're doing precision shooting, there's some guys that get really into that carbon fouling issue. And I personally found when I was doing long range shooting thousand yard stuff, uh, D, D, uh, Taking the copper out of the barrel was actually detrimental to my accuracy until the barrel stabilized again. So um, you don't want it to get too extreme, like you said, but the reality is taking it all out actually decreases your accuracy for a while. And and that was what my impression of it was as well, was, you know, just from, from rimfire, you know, you, you, they, there's guys in, in the, like 22 that they swear you never strip that freaking the lead. Of course, it's a different round but you don't strip the lead out of the, the barrel because it's going to broaden up your group. So I imagined it was something similar, but I didn't know if it was detrimental to have that copper just sitting in there you know, along to interact with the powder and potentially cause some, uh, some fouling and, and your barrel. So, Well, you know, on the logistician and the, the busy work thing, um, I'm going to go ahead and throw a little bit of unqualified opinion out there, but it's based on my research. Um, I think it goes back to, you know, your, your legacy black powder being very corrosive. And then they went to smokeless powder, but the primer was still very corrosive. And if you didn't punch the board, and if you didn't do this, and if you didn't do that, it was going to destroy your gun. So people didn't fully understand the, the ammunition technology as it advanced. So they think, oh, it's going to tear your gun up if you don't if you don't punch the bore every time you shoot it. But that was true 100 years ago. It's not true today. And then we had the debacle in Vietnam where, you know, the M16, before the M16A1, they didn't follow Stoner's design specs on the ammunition or on the, uh, the, the, uh, the chrome line barrels. And, and guns choked because they didn't follow the design specifications. So, holy shit, it's a maintenance queen. If you don't clean it every day, it's it, it's going to fucking break. Come on, man. We're, we're better than that now, but people haven't learned from that. And they're still using things that they thought they learned 50 years ago. And there is that little added bit of busy work. And there is there that added little bit of, if it's in the army, it's got to be, you know, dress right dress. And it's got to be white glove at all times. So there's a mixture of all of the above. At least that's my opinion. Chuck, what would you say? Yep, exactly who I was about to call because he had some slightly different experiences. Oh, you, you're not coming through. No, no audio. I'm hearing you fine, dude. Keep talking. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't there know what's up with that. Um, so there is no basis in reality uh, whatsoever for um, the level of cleanliness that we require when our military service weapons leave uh, 10 level maintenance and go to 20, 30, 40 level uh, maintenance. For you civilians that don't know what that means, uh, that means that during the United States Army is not really qualified 
to identify or diagnose their fucking extractor string on their rifle bull carrier group. Like that's beyond their level of HUA. So uh, there are certain tests that are in the 10 series that can uh, guide higher into making those determinations. But shit that you AR wrench monkeys like is standard stuff. That's like its own military occupational specialty in the military. So, um, you know, then when you start talking about you can't bring guns in military ve- uh, in civilian vehicles and all the military vehicles are down for maintenance, that's when you get some kid walking down our den street in 82nd with a fucking Red Rider wagon full of busted-ass guns with shoe tags on them going up to the main support battalion to get fucking black donuts and extractor springs put on guns. That's a fact. That's the reality, all right? So when we talk about these 20, 30, 40 level monkeys that actually wrench on guns, no offense, Chad, um, certain amount of gun snobbery that is involved. Like, oh, I've got 200 rifles today. Guess what? I ain't getting cancer. I ain't bringing that shit back to my kids. Hand me a fucking gun that I pull the bolt carrier out and it's black. I'm going to send you your fucking rifle back to your house. You clean your gun. That ain't my job to clean your fucking gun. So it is literally about experiencing the armor that is going to to take apart and look at and diagnose your shit that is beyond your level to diagnose. So a filthy 14 is not acceptable when you're passing it off to another human being to do the shit that you should be doing anyway, but the army doesn't trust you to do. So that's where we got it. We got to get into the, the whole humans in the system here and human nature it has nothing to do with science metallurgy or any of that other bullshit it has to do with the army or the dod the big green weenie um not go on because that's just the way it is guys you know if i was president for a day i'd fix that shit but i wasn't president for a day uh so uh red wagon and some fucking 30 series checks with a clean rifle are, are the sop until you know trump gets down in the weeds i guess uh, it's going, he's got to drain a lot of water out of that swamp before we get to that fucking point. But, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, gauging, yes. Uh, if you're actually obstructing the gauge, and these gauges are taking minute measurements on throat erosion or whatever, if you have so much crap in your barrel that the gauge is wedging in there, you know, it's supposed to be going down a smooth rifled surface, and if that shit looks like, you know, going down spelunking into a cave, with divots of carbon and bullshit in there, I think the gauge is going to get hung up. And so it's going to give you false readings uh, on the weapon system uh, uh, right there. And then finally, the last point, since I think we hit three main points, about removing or changing the status of the shit that's in your barrel. Um, It goes back to the old sniper adage of consistency equals accuracy. If you throw sweets down that barrel and you filled in all those imperfections, those microscopic imperfections in your weapon, uh, and then you go out, um, you're gonna, it's going to do something different because you've added another variable into the, into the system. I've been in places where when we cleaned the barrels and we punched them after missions, uh, we would leave them, and then we had a, fi- a shooting area on the way to our, our vehicles, and the snipers would walk by the barrel and fire 10 rounds of uh, 118LR into a sandbox to foul their gun prior to going out on that night's mission. So that the cold bore shot was not the first shot out of a clean bore. Um, We'll jump off of AR-15s just a second to prove or highlight this point. Um, Along the line, competition guys shooting cop 1911s didn't catch on in the tactical market. Everybody missed that. And then the same dudes that were shooting comp, uh, comp 1911s started shooting comp Glocks. And now it's caught on in the market. And why the comp 1911s didn't catch on. And that was um, inconsistency in terms of carbon removal within the expansion ports of the comp. Uh, those guns had to be cleaned more extensively in order for them to fire because of the precision tolerances of the weapons or whatever. So you would be shooting, uh, let's say, 500 rounds through your 1911 uh, over two days or whatever. Nah, more than that. Let's say 1,000 rounds over a week. 
you get out there every day and you shoot and your rounds are just a little bit off. So you're putting one click, two clicks, three clicks on your adjustable rear sight. And you do this over a month and then you finally decide you're going to deep dive into the gun. And so you take it down to the shop and you get out your sandblaster and you blow all the carbon out of your compensator. The next time you go back to shoot 25 meter bulls, every click that you put in that weapon over a month, all manifest themselves simultaneously. And your 1911 tack driver is now shooting eight inches to the 11 o'clock because you've removed all the carbon out of the expansion ports. And you got all eight inches at one time. Whereas you had moved it eight inches over the course of a month, a half inch to a quarter of an inch at a time. One click at a time. Click, click, click. Adding in to compensate for how the carbon is affecting uh, that weapon system as it shoots. I asked these questions when I went down this road. I was like, why the fuck did more people shoot comps back in the day? And the answer I got was, the shit was inconsistent. You never knew when somebody was going to grab your, uh, was going to tell you to grab your pistol and your fucking job was on the line. Show up on the line and perform. And that level of inconsistency and accuracy with the handgun was not worth the recoil mitigation for some of those guys because their jobs depended on it. Um, we don't see, or I have not seen, that exact same situation manifest itself in compensated Glocks or compensated mod modern polymer guns, not compensated race guns. But I just find that interesting that, um, you know, it all came, you know, it all came competition to military to tactical law enforcement but we just skipped that entire generation of compensation on, uh, on uh, the pistols of the 80s. They never made it to the popo. They never made it to the military. And, uh, and that's the reason it was explained to me. So anyway, that's my tirade about changing shit on your gun uh, down the barrel and, and how that affects stuff. A couple things come to mind on that. And for same problem for different reasons. I would never go to a precision long-range rifle match with a clean barrel. Bad idea. Things will go awry. It's, it will absolutely screw you up. So that's one thing I always went with a foul barrel and always will go with a foul barrel for the same reasons but for different goals. The other two things that come to mind is one reason to cause people or require people to do cleaning on their guns is it provides them an opportunity to inspect the gun and look for things that are wrong, although that may be above their pay grade. And two, maybe to gain greater familiarity with the rifle when they may not otherwise. Chad? So what's the topic we're on right now? Your hat. I think, I, think we're, I think we're still talking about cleaning and maintenance, Poor right? Chance. I mean, so if the gun doesn't require cleaning to be reliable and work like we think it does, that's one thing. But maybe requiring people to do cleaning and maintenance on the gun at greater intervals than I should be required still provides an opportunity to inspect the weapon and gain familiarity. A long time ago, somebody asked me to write something up on Light Fighter. And it's still hanging up on Light Fighter about preventative maintenance. Everybody talks about PMing their shit. Well, it's preventative maintenance. You're just removing fouling, gunk, whatever, mud, butt lint, so that the armor can perform his level of gauging and visual inspection and functions checks. That's it. Beyond that, it's a matter of if you've got saltwater immersion, whatever, you got to get it off the gun, get it dry, get it clean, get it re-looped. Now, the incestuous institutional inbreeding that happens at the unit level armories now was not an armor in the Marine Corps. I was a grunt first. Um, but what happens at that level is it becomes a little fiefdom, their own little empire. And so they get to tell all these grunts, make their lives living hell every day. It gives them that little bit of leverage to make their lives hell. Because they had, if, if you have a 0330 wake up, well, they have to be up earlier than you to go unlock the armory and shit. So they're pissed in the first place. Um, it just turns into uh, the tail wagging the dog as far as what clean has to be. And yeah, there is, you know, the whole, they got to look at 300 guns. Well, it better be clean because they don't want to get dirty because they got to pay to get their shit dry clean too. Um, but yeah, preventative maintenance is all about removing the gunk so they can gauge it and visually inspect it and ensure its serviceability for the next day's work. That's it. And there's probably a bit of overlap or 
incursion coming from higher where you have a board XO that wants to come down and do a spot check. And so these guys get hit once, maybe twice. And so that's lessons learned. So it's going to be white glove inspection ready at all times because heaven forbid that gunny is going to get his ass chewed again. So it's a bunch of fuck fuck games and it's stupid and excessive maintenance kills, kills weapons. You know, we used to send boots out of the P out of the armory to around the corner, the PX on the other side of the wire to get Pepsi. And they throw the Pepsi over the back fence so we could soak T40 bolts and, and saw bolts and piston heads in there to get rid of the, the fouling and stuff. Not that it, that probably didn't really kill the guns. It worked. It worked better than CLP, but well, the, it, um, the Pepsi, your active ingredient there is the phosphoric acid. Uh, you know, worse it was going to do was uh, maybe uh, dissolve a little bit of the part. But if you're, you know, well, they, how they, much killed, they, they used to remove anyways. barnacles off of ships. So, yeah. So now I, I think one thing we do need to make sure that we put out to the, the uh, <clears throat> audience is this is not suggesting that you shouldn't lube the weapon. This is just saying that, you know, hey, regular carbon buildup, you know, minus whatever whatever gauging requirements that might be in there isn't necessarily a bad thing but that doesn't mean just turn it in all rusty if you're if you're in a turning into an arms room turn it in rusty and freaking sit there and say fuck off you know hey make sure you're taking care of the weapon through lubing the exterior and possibly the interior but not necessarily just stripping all the carbon and copper out does that, does that sound about right yeah, an interesting point, Chuck, or interesting point, uh, Chad, I'm sorry, made about the armorer, you know, and, and Chuck also, the 20 or 30 or 40 level maintenance, it, at least in the general purpose forces in the Army, your unit level armorer is not allowed to do anything above a 10 level maintenance. Why that is, I don't know. They sent him to armorer school for a reason but he's not allowed to punch two pins to take the trigger mechanism out and look at it. it you, if you can't I'll break you. down a trigger group, what are you other than a glorified supply yeah. guy? So that was a uh, yeah. that that yeah. was a counter that was a counter proliferation of military weapons parts in the uh, early nineties as the mm -hmm. fear about domestic white boy terrorism became a real thing. They removed all spare parts from unit level arms room so the broke dick 11 bravo even though he was armor qualified could not have ejector and extractor springs uh down at the because they were afraid that now they weren't afraid that it would happen the fbi was sting after sting after sting and finding 556 five, uh colt military barrels on on weapons finding full auto sears uh, you know, th things of that nature. Uh, it was it was a real, real problem. It was nothing as bad as the Marines selling uh, AT4s and laws, but um, specialist yeah, tent peg <laughs> selling, you know, <laughs> specialist tent peg selling uh, extractor springs was a, a threat to national security. So they pulled all of the spare parts kits up to the depot level maintenance uh, and the main support battalions. Uh, probably somebody correct me wrong on my dates. Uh, Probably no later than ninety two or ninety three. Yeah, uh, I, I can what understand I understood that it was... with the auto sears, but with a trigger, come on. Unless you're dealing with a burst trigger, the only difference between a semi-auto gun and an auto gun is the auto sear. And let's go back. You know, again, you, I, I had a took a dumbass pill one morning and fumbled the lower receiver sitting outside the arms room and that once in a lifetime i could never do it again if i tried it landed on a concrete floor exactly the right way it snapped a front pivot pin and i had to take it to the armor and say hey dude i need a new pivot pin in my gun i fumbled it. and it took three weeks to put my gun back together because it had to go to 30 level maintenance when i could have gone downtown bought a pivot print pivot pin with a deep tent and a spring been back on post 30 minutes later three minutes of work my gun's operational but it's got to go to the shop and it's down for three weeks that's that's ridiculous so hey, mike as as chuck said the reason being is back in the 90s you had armors who also would sit there and basically get parts kits 
through through the uh, you know spare parts and were building their own weapons. So they were building their own full auto to sixties and, and all that. And the only they were getting got when they bought, they try and get extra receivers and stuff like that. Right. And I said I problem. understand that, but we're we're talking a pivot pin. We're talking an extractor. We're not talking auto sears. Auto sears, okay, they should be controlled items. But a pivot pin, right. an extractor spring this is it, it's ridiculous man well i mean it's it also goes into uh like the rails when uh i've been working on a, a rail free float rail um through uh through the sop mod kit trying the 80 second and i had, had to go down and talk to the soft farmer to actually get the rails mounted on that weapon because our armors were not our not even our armors our repairers were not authorized to remove the front sight post had to turn those weapons into depot to remove the front side post i took it down to uh, the stuff armor range 37 he's like why there there's no reason they can't do it it's just two pins so oh some case it's kind of a like uh, like chuck was saying it's it's you know they just they don't feel like they can do it so they don't do it yeah i uh, my issue with the spare parts was, you know, uh, I came in the army and, and uh, after about a year, year and a half in a rifle squad, I went to a weapon squad and I was a machine gunner for a uh, couple of years. And until I started testing the mag 58 for the Rangers, I was stuck with a 60. The life cycle on an M60 extractor spring is a thousand rounds. Basic load on the gun is 1100 fucking rounds. How can you, how can you feel the weapon system that has a spring that is weaker than its basic load, and then not have spare parts available down at the at the company level, or in this case at the squad gun team level? Like I should be, I should be issued some springs. Hey, here's eleven hundred rounds of seven six two and an extra spring, bucko. Have a nice day. But no, can't can't give springs to Ranger Pressburg. Nope. Looking. Just watch that shock group. Watch that that pile of brass migrate. It's probably just know you're about to start getting some kachunk. Yeah, it's it's a five cent. It's coming too. It's not like it's a high dollar <laughs> part. It's a five cent. <laughs> little empire yeah, little, builders, man. Little AR fifteen theory here to to touch on some of the things you guys were talking about. Um, specifically, the auto sear and the M sixteen and AR fifteen. Um, there's there's really no good reason why there's not auto sears in the AR-15 out there. Um, in fact, from I think a, a safety in uh, safety and design and operation standpoint, they should have all your AR-15s, even semi-auto only ones, should have auto sears in them to prevent uh, out of battery bullshit. Um, you know, that's just some that's some product of cold and ATF fear mongering essentially. Um, you know, without, without getting into the weeds in terms of, you know, how to make, you know, machine guns, um, it's not the critical part, um, uh, in terms of making your AR-15 and M or full auto, right? Um, a lot of the, the auto sear boogeyman uh, in the world is, is really unfounded. Um, it's, it's the... Triggers, disconnects, and selectors where that will get everyone in trouble. The auto sears, auto sears not hurting nobody. And that's just and and that's just the way it, it you know that's just how the, the function of the part is. It's not doing anything. Any it's not making the gun full auto. It's keeping it from blowing up when you go full auto. But but with all this bureaucracy notwithstanding, the reality is is that what these guns require from a cleaning perspective is far less than what most people think and do. So bureaucracy is one thing, and we've, we've defined a lot of that insanity. But in terms of an AR-15 or an M4 or whatever, what you need to do to keep it running versus what we are doing are frequently very different things. And I have a, an example that I'm going to shout out. and I'm going to have Chuck provide, which is going to be contrarian, but it, it makes sense and it fits in what we're discussing. I will, okay, it's not contrarian, but it, uh, as far as lubrication is concerned, Chad... With with a typical AR-15, what is the what's the suggested uh, way of lubricating it? 
where and how much? Are you asking me? Yeah. For my employer. Oh, you specifically. <laughs> I, yeah, you. What Dish you it down, what, man. What It'll get rid best? of what it doesn't need. Wow. <laughs> just like Pat Rogers. Where do you think he learned it from? I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> he can't defend himself. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so <laughs> cold. So cold. Now, hey, man. Hey, his flip to the right up. Guess who's mentioned? That's me. Um, I still no, use flip. It, it depends. If the gun's already assembled and you got it loaded, go through the ejection port on it, right? Right through the gas, off gassing ports in the scallop, right? If it's not loaded and you, for whatever reasons, have taken your gun apart, go ahead, hit the shiny points. Why, why the it'll shiny get points? Rid- hmm. Because those are the. Those are the friction bearing areas. They are polished either by the manufacturer or under firing conditions. Wow, that was like textbook. That was awesome. You're welcome. Um, so to counter that, Just I remember turn my talking, handle. I'll keep going all day. Yeah, no, that's great. And you have a great radio voice for it too because you don't have to keep it down. Um, that's awesome, right? Yeah. I already put her to sleep. Um, I remember Chuck was talking about uh, something, the, the condition he kept his weapons in, but it was for a specific purpose regarding lubrication and that they were not lubed. They just needed a run. Can you give a quick rundown on that? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, everybody knows and, and all the Army test data shows that um, sand is not an excuse to have lube. That highly lubricated guns, even though they attract sand, run better than dry guns that attract less sand. Um, but where you get into the issue is if you're going to pull this kind of half-ass maintenance where you're just kind of adding more oil, adding more oil, the sand just continues to accumulate and cake onto the gun. So you have to disassemble the weapon. You've got to pull the bolt. You've got to run a toothbrush in there and kind of get the sand out of, out of your, uh, you know, out of your locking lug re- recesses and, and, and all that, you know. Uh, the compressed air work as well when the gun is lubricated because the lube sticks to the wet surface areas like glue and it's much harder to blow out. Now, if you are on a high op tempo where you're not getting a lot of sleep, you're not getting a lot of downtime, you're not getting a lot of dress uh, rest, and it's it's rinse, wash, repeat, the reality is that you're probably not firing enough rounds on every single night that you go outside of the wire that you require all of that lubrication in order to keep your DI gun running. Uh, So I'm happy with a weapon that can shoot an entire mag bone dry. That's, That's my litmus test. I want it to be light, dusty, and still be able to get through a mag bone dry. If I'm conducting a magazine change in a gunfight, shit's on. I'd say less than 10% of my gunfights ever got a magazine change, ever. Uh, so when I go to, to change that first mag, first off, I'm behind cover and I'm kind of looking around like, hey, you guys checking this shit out? Like, this is a real firefight. Like, this isn't a killing tonight. Like, these dudes have decided they want to fight. So we need to switch gears. We're not just running around in the dark murdering people. Like, it's a fucking gunfight. And so once I uh, have made that determination, then I I use the oil technique, actually carry the oil bottle on me. So during the first magazine change, I apply all the oil. And I use the technique, uh, we call it douching, because I don't think that a female is actually worried about the placement. They just kind of get it there and squeeze the bottle and just kind of let it work itself around. So... I douche the firearm uh, with the oil bottle, and then um, then I get back to the gunfight, and I, I conclude the gunfight, and then I know now that I've douched the rifle, I've got to go back and wipe her down and get all the sand out of there that night. But if I'm only having to do a mag change once out of 10 missions, why spend 15 minutes of pull bolt, wipe bolt, wipe inside, air, air hose, reply oil, put gun back in booth, but I didn't fire around that night. I can walk in, 
rack the round out, leave the bolt open, hit the inside of the gun with the air compressor, throw it in the rack, and go the fuck to sleep. So I lube when I need lube. I don't lube when I don't need lube. And, I mean, if, if shit is so incredibly bad that I don't have time to apply oil, I've probably transitioned to my handgun or gone and found a belt fed at that point. Once I'm done eliminating the immediate threat, tackle to my pistol, grabbed my slide locked rifle, found some cover and concealment, looked at my buddy, told a fucking cheesy joke, and gotten another mag out of my pouch. Somewhere in there, I'm going to grab the oil bottle and <laughs> stick it in there. Probably while I'm laughing, like, did you see that fucking guy over there? Dude, Tommy just shot him right in the fucking face. This is a fucking gunfight. Let's do this. And and so, like, there's a little tactical commentary while we go ahead and get this gun wet. And then we, and then we put our... Ser seriously, seriously, they're shooting at us. All right, game face. All right, let's go. And then we come around the corner from behind the cover, and we get back in the gunfight. But, you know, that's why they make big armored vehicles and buildings and shit. You just got to go hide behind them sometimes and, like, collect your thoughts. And, like, you know, wow, things escalated quickly. Somebody would have tried it. I mean, like, you've got, you have to have to have those moments. And in those moments, add some extra lube as needed. That's all I'm saying. Brick, where did you get a hand grenade? Okay, so with that in mind, definitely not advisable for law enforcement. Um, also, what Chuck was working in was an environment, a team environment. So, yeah, not a good idea for law enforcement, I, I'm going to have to say. No, but I will say that I, I live in a desert environment and I do matches and such that are very filthy and dirty if you've ever watched our two-gun stuff. And I get this question a lot on in-range. How important is this? The answer is very important. This thing is useful. Close the damn door when you're not using the gun. Yeah, Pat ingrained that in, with me. It's, it goes a long way. Yeah. It really does. You know, push that here and it's not desert at all. Brother, you can't, like, it really doesn't matter to the flat range guy, but dude, be a grunt in a live fire exercise to conduct individual movement techniques. When you go and push up, you know, like you're doing like the burpee kind of, you go push up to fucking run, as that knee comes off the ground to get up under your body, it's slinging all of that sand up under you in a forward momentum. And if that highly lubricated AR is in your right hand, on its left side with the ejection port facing up and the dust cover open, it is awesome. It looks like Happy Gilmore trying to get out of a sand trap in that motherfucker. So, um, <laughs> yeah, try, try a little three to five second rush and then ask me, uh, tell me how important the fucking dust cover is, man. <laughs> Stand up commandos. They don't know nothing about that. Like, they're like five and a half feet away from the dirt. Get down in the fucking dirt. That shit's a lot closer to the ejection port. <laughs> I got a question for you. We're seeing some more guns now that don't have uh, dust covers. Like, look at the Scar 16 or 17, for example. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's more out there, but a lot of these new guns are omitting dust covers. What do you think about that? Are you asking Chuck about that? Or is that a general? I think Carl's going to have some good insight on that. Yeah, I think the Tavor is also another example. It doesn't have a dust cover. <laughs> the Tavor is a freaking joke, bro. <laughs> that thing is a mess. I love it. Like we get students in our classes all the time with Tavors, and it's great until you get into asymmetrical positions or you actually have a malfunction. And good luck, bro. Like it is not. It's not a design that is there for actually running the gun and actually fixing the gun on your own without having to find something to hit hit it with i've been on a bull like, it's a mess i've been an anti-bullpup jihad for a while now and i've been getting lots of people pissed at me about it but it's just the reality you don't you don't sit down to design a great rifle and then suddenly shit out a bullpup you sit down to design a <laughs> bullpup and then shit out a bad gun that's how that generally works um there might be niche applications but the reality is none of them are all that great in terms of the dust cover question um I, I think it's a bad idea. I think it's omitting a very simplistic part that makes a big difference in terms of weapon reliability, personally. And um, even though our mud test things are ridiculously over-exaggerated, dust covers would go a long way in mitigating many of the problems that we see exhibited when that stuff gets into the action of the gun. So I think they're playing with fire by leaving them off, personally. Something to be considered about the SCAR specifically is that it's a gun designed by committee. 
And so don't take it like as designer's intent. Like they actually had a reason for leaving the dust cover off other than the fact that like Didge from Team 3 thought that it was unneeded and they were had like the last say on the matter probably. I don't know if it's yeah, actually Team 3 like or 20 not, cents. We can't have that. Yeah, but that's how you end up with three different selectors and different grip angles and all this other crap. It was a gun designed by committee. And every time they went back to the EUAs or whatever, they had different feedback. They're back and forth all the time. So just because it doesn't have that feature doesn't mean that the dudes running the thing were like, oh, God damn it. Like, they might have been trying to push for it. Because you look at the other guns that it's patterned off of, a few of them do have dust covers. So. Yeah, I – uh I reviewed the draft SCAR operational requirements document for my Ranger Battalion when I was the Force Mod NCO, and I was surprised how much stuff was mandated in there and how much stuff was, like, totally wide open. Um, SCAR absolutely, like, written in there, uh, not not a, an objective, a threshold requirement. Uh, magazine will be inserted in front of the pistol grip. Like, it was on there in black and white before anybody made the gun. Somebody uh, was like, mm, bull pups, not so much. So uh, when well, that thing was still still a black and white piece of paper, it, it was not a bull pup. I just thought that was interesting. Dudes in 1876 realized they wanted dust covers on guns. Um, this is a good idea. It's been around a long time. Man. Hey, Dugan. I saw that you just came in. Hey, what's up? How's it going, guys? Good. How, how was your training? It was good. I guess a, a, body, a body doesn't float to the surface for four and a half days with normal body weight after submersion at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's good to know. Were you on the news tonight? At least your class? I don't. I hope not. Okay. Because on the news tonight, they were talking about a very similar class. I'm like, wait a minute, Dugan might be on TV. But, but what if you pump them full of hydrogen or helium? Doesn't that change the result? That's another modcast. Well, if, they, if it's a, if it's alcohol related, I guess it like uh, makes them float to the service a lot sooner. So there's like a 20% decrease in the time, which is interesting. Oh, they ferment. That's awesome. Or if they eat Mexican food. Uh, yeah. I wonder if there's a half life like. How many years do I have to be sober until my liver loses its buoyancy? I, I don't know. <laughs> well, wait a minute. If I remember correctly, you were one of those neutral buoyant people, too. So this oh, no. I'm, I'm absolutely positively oh, no, you... buoyant. I am positively <laughs> buoyant. You had difficulty getting down to the bottom. Yeah, my scoop instructors, man, they were like, are, are you fucking kidding me? Get over here to the tunnel. And they, like, reached over and grabbed some two and a, two and a half and five-pound plates and put them in the fucking Velcro flap of my buoyancy compensator. And I'm like, all right, there you go, stud. Because as soon as I would take that weight belt off, it was, like, fucking free ascent, man. I'm struggling to <laughs> stay slower than the bubbles, man. <laughs> Helicopter kick. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. So there have been all some requests buoyancy. to discuss that whole piston versus direct impingement. Is it time, you think? Sweet. With this large panel, let's go ahead and throw this out there. The uh, AR-15 isn't exactly DI. The bolt kind of is the piston. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's true. A place, that's a good place to start. Is Yeah, let's call it gas and pinch. And I think that's what the patent actually may say. Um, where, yeah, your direct boot and pinch, it's like the old uh, sw or the French whatever ag42 or something like that um yeah so we'll call it gas impingement i want to hear i want to hear chad's first since he's got some special uh piston knowledge there um okay. by the way you were thinking of the moss 49 which is a french truly di gun i think all i was going to say was that uh the game has changed quite a bit over the past 15 years. If you go back about 10 years, it was totally different. I think the big thing that changed was the end user level knowledge of how to make the M16, M4 family actually run well. And we've been talking about a lot of the issues already. Um, a, lot, a lot of the reasoning behind why 
in the open market why the piston got so popular is because people thought that um, the AR wasn't reliable, whatever. Um, and it was it was uh, maintenance intensive. Um, now the the real piston gun out there, the 416, was not brought about to my understanding for those reasons. It is surely high round count longevity. Um, they were burning through M4s at a biblical rate, and they needed a gun that can survive a training cycle. Um, and this gun does it. Um, but the my observation over it all, try to boil it down as much as possible, is that there's a few companies, very few as in like two, that have really brought some advent to the AR family and they prove certain features in processes and platings or whatever that have actually brought new legs to the AR family. And so they kind of were their own undoing in a way. And so you got nitrided barrels that are cold hammer forged and the nickel boron, nickel Teflon and all that other stuff that uh, the, the cross compatibility actually saves the DI at the piston gun expense. Um, I think it was like a, an evolutionary step that actually took a step sideways somewhere along in the gap and was able to save the DI gun at, at the same time. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense. I'm trying to keep it short because a lot of people that want to talk. I don't know, say something, somebody, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you bring up an interesting point with that kind of that sidestepping evolution. Um, and I, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, my big, it's always been my big beef and contention uh, with the piston stuff. And just a little background here. Um, I kind of lorded over both DI or gas impingement and piston. Uh, impingement systems uh, you know we had uh, at my my tincture there at uh, CMMG we had I had to deal with both setups and some other stuff in between um, and my basic look at on it is pistons are fine they they work um, where where the conflict comes from is this the pistons in the AR-15 um, and the AR-15 from the get-go was designed around this gas impingement system and pretty much everything out uh, receivers, bolt carriers, just the basic layout of the gun uh, was designed around uh, working around that, uh, keeping everything in line um, and that gas impingement system. So you, when you throw a piston on that, everything you're now you're starting to have to chase the tail of this dragon of wear and funkiness and, and, uh, all sorts of stuff like that where you like carrier tilt and, and you know, the w funky wear and spring and, you know, the operational like vectors of everything there. Um, and then, you know, you get the other thing, like the, the whole receiver extension buttstock situation stops making a lot of sense uh, when you do that, because the only real advantage was that was to keep everything nicely concentric and in line. Um, and then when we've got our, you know, our operating system and forces above that, you know, that, that center axis, uh, a lot of that kind of go, the, the point of some of that stuff kind of goes out the window. Um, so basically what I'm saying, if you want a piston gun, you know, get a piston, something that's, uh, you know, designed as a piston gun from the, from the ground from up. The ground up. Yeah. And that's really always been, that's my only real beef. The whole, the, the whole debate is, is the AR more so than any other firearm in the world was designed around that operating system and to just change that operating system you've ended up with something that's suboptimal optimal for that type of operating system but i mean i think i think i would also argue that the gas impingement ar is not deficient in fact in many ways it's it's the efficient system it's less weight it is reliable when done properly there are certain advantages and changes that have come along evolutionarily speaking, like for example, the, the Gemtech adjustable bolt carrier group that allows you to change the gas feed into the system if it's suppressed or not and others like it. Things like that have changed the game and the, the gas impingement AR is really an excellent firearm and it handles, in my opinion, better than a lot of the piston equivalents. Yeah, 
it's definitely an even more even playing field. But I'll tell you what, though, um, you give it, you, you give those guns to to Chirk and his Chuck and his dirty boys over there, and you'll see where things shake out. Like for the average North American end user, yeah, it'll be it'll, it'll be fine. But there's there's some absolute monsters that run guns to the point of shaking them apart. And uh, like I, I know exactly how a a Colt, you know, M four A one and Mark eighteen will break down because I've killed a lot of them, like hundreds of them. Um, and I know exactly how an LWRC will break down because I've killed a couple of those and I still own four of them. Um, it, it's what you need. What For an LWRC, you're looking at overall, like amortized with the cost of parts and goods, you know, put into the gun to get it to you. Um, the cost increase you're looking at roughly like seven, eight hundred bucks just for the cost of the piston parts, roughly. Um, so for that added cost for the piston, are you really seeing a return on investment? Now, if you can say yes, then awesome, go for it. And even more so with like the 416, go for it. But if you can't say you can see the actual net benefit of going to that more expensive baller ass gun, then hey, don't go for it. There's a, there's a plenty of awesome guns that have a lot of the same features that are going to run just as ferociously within your, your own personal metric of running it hard, right? Um, that you can afford to shoot it on your own dollar. This is like the same argument about the Roland Special. It's not for everyone. Yeah, if, if, if you, you can't afford to this, feed it plus P, then yeah. don't waste your time with it. Yeah, it's not for everyone. Chuck, well, uh... Go ahead. I was going to say, what I was curious what Chuck thought about the piston versus gas impingement thing, because he was brought up on that. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm a big... Sorry, I added you, bro. Uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a smart, like, I'm not a smart gun, like, smarty person. Uh, John Knipe won't let me touch uh, the inside of guns. Like, I just, like, hand him some pieces and say, I want that in my gun, and he makes it happen. Otherwise... I'll get a Leatherman out and try to do that shit and it just hurts him. Um, that being said, you know, I uh, carried three different 416s. My first one uh, I got from a thing that Eric Graves and uh, Jose Gordon were doing. Um, little, I borrowed theirs while mine was stuck in uh, Customs Hell. Then I had uh, my so actually four different 416s. My second one was a uh, 416 upper receiver on a full auto. L I fucking Nazi wonder gun lower was customs bonded warehouse. So uh, I went down range with a Franken gun of LMT and 416. I, uh, then when I came back from that trip, my wonder gun lower had gotten out of customs. So I put that thing together. That was, that was 16 number three and then uh, I got another 416 and I carried that same rifle for nine years straight and I put three barrels on it I shot out three barrels on the same gun and uh, uh, that's three barrels on one of the two receivers I had for the same gun and uh, the guns just run man they run they're like little air 15 controls now there's a weight penalty and there's a, um, a recoil impulse penalty. Part of a weapons evaluation down select, and I had a manufacturer send in two ARs. One was the piston gun, and one was a, a a direct gas, and they were of the exact same rifle. They basically just changed the operating system, and I fired these two weapons made by the manufacturer ARs. There was extremely noticeable in recoil uh, on the gas gun. They just shoot softer. Uh, the the recoil in guns is just much rougher. It's it's much sharper. You know, uh, it just is what it is. Um, I have an MR556 turned down to 10.3. Uh, 
uh, that's tricked out and it's in my gun safe. I have two extra bolts and a couple of um, rings for it. And that's, uh, that's my end of the world gun with the parts of my pocket. Uh, even, even if rounds are keyholing after, you know, 30, 30,000 rounds through the barrel, I, I can shoot uh, till, till I die once the lights go out with that rifle and that rifle alone. That's backed up with, you know, those are to pass out to other people. They're not, not for me. In the event that I can't get back to my fucking spare parts, uh, I know that that 416 is going to run. It's just going to keep running, and it's going to keep running, and it's going to keep running. I mean, the gun is just amazing. That's not a gas versus... That's a, I got a Nazi wonder gun. I've only shot Nazi wonder guns since... T t and the fucking guns run. So uh, I give the Nazi gun a thumbs up, and, you know, that that falls somewhere in the argument we're having, but that's all I got. Yeah. That was something I, I, I've always kind of wondered about with the, uh, the four sixteen specifically, um, is it's, it's goodness, I guess, uh, is w where does it fall on the spectrum of where that's coming from? Is it because it's a piston or is it because of an HK? And uh, yeah, I'd almost make the argument that most of it's coming because it's the HK and they've overbuilt the shit out of it. Um, and, and done their homework essentially, um, and the, just the freak a bit of the crowd space magic, um, and yeah. The HK's the four sixteenth biggest, I guess the biggest flea or flaw, is effective HK, dude, and its customers can't get support. Yeah, like part everybody else trickle down, everybody else trickle down from. You know the higher well higher echelons like they they can't get the parts. Yeah, part support um, and 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 weight. You know, they kind of made them heavy, but again, you know how much you know. There's some uh, uh, some of that some of that weight pays dividends on the back end in terms of durability and re reliability too. So yeah, it does. But they don't they don't skimp whenever they're right. I mean, you look at their seven six two gun; they're running a steel upper receiver. Like, <laughs> like, they could probably cut a few more corners, but well, it, you know, the dudes have been to Obendorf, they're like, there's that, no telling those engineers anything. So, and you know, it'd be nice, it'd be interesting to know exactly the reason for that. If that's just a rigidity and and strength, or or is that some uh, is that some bolt tilt or bolt tilting wear on the uh, there on the, the kind of that bottom take down lug hoop uh, of the upper receiver. Maybe, yeah, maybe. I because there's they were, you know, they no cracking, doubt when they were cracking up above the ejection port for a while there. They had a run, and I don't know if they did, had a metallurgy change or if they pushed tooling too long, but they were cracking receivers from the forward edge of the upper or the ejection port around to where the op rod came through the front receiver. Yeah, well, that's um, that's that's where uh, if you crank sideways on a M4 upper too much, that that's where they'll break too. Or yeah. there in the you know the bottom there the magwell cut out. Yep. So I guess the, the, my, the problem the right. problem with was that you had to remove the barrel to identify uh, the cracking until it went all the way through and became visible. So uh, when you started doing checks for that. Blow for for that cracking. You knew you were going to have to go and and redo your laser and your back of iron sights and everything. And you were going to, you know, that was a that was a half day half day of shenanigans getting your gun thrown out afterwards. Um, fortunately, uh, it was the only place that uh, I ever was at that schedule, deployment cycle, and alert cycle of the organization and plan the cyclical ammunition, uh, or excuse me, services around that. One of the things that asked about both the 82nd and the Ranger Regiment uh, was that they did not have a good plan in place to do um, and weapons taken care of once you were done with intensive training cycles. Uh, 
obligatory would grew at random times. So I'd be on alert for like a month and then I'd come into the arms room and there'd be white paint pin X's on the fucking pinholes on like five lower receivers of the platoon. Oh, look, steel fucking pins have bored out the aluminum. Those guns are not repairable to this station. And I knew those four privates or sergeants, whoever, their guns were fucking gone. The next time we came in the arms room, there was going to be a brand new M4A1 with all of that kid's shit bolted on the new gun and zero. Who the fuck knows? Uh, so now I got to get ammunition, transportation, training time, uh, range time, medical coverage, uh, or we're going to send this kid into combat with fucking an unzeroed weapon, much like Blackwater. So, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what, what is the answer to that? And, and where I work, they didn't fuck with your guns and gauge shit and go looking for problems that were going to deadline weapons unless you were in a cycle that deadlining your weapon wasn't a big deal. Uh, and, and there's just too many moving parts in the regular army uh, or, or in the regular DOD to sync, to sync that up. Um, you can't have whatever battalion of the parachute regiment fucking get their shit down to third shop uh, right after they come off, uh, you know, whatever cycle and before they go on whatever cycle. It just never seems to fucking happen that way. And it's nobody's fault. Anyway, I'm wondering. Yeah, I think Gunner had a question, or he's going to say something. So uh, that was that was one thing I did want to know. Is just you know, with all these proliferation of these gas piston systems, you know, is there really like you you've been saying? So the takeaway I'm getting is there's no real benefit one over the other as far as reliability, as long as it's a purpose built system. I mean, I talked there, to Larry. There's, there's, there's two consensus. systems that I that I personally trust, and that's HK and the LWRC. Um, mm -hmm. I have far more experience on the LWRC. Like, hell, I even got my wife from LWRC, so that's just full disclosure. But you know, those are the two guns. The, any of the other piston manufacturers out there, I know, got good dudes are that will like rep or be like, hey, these these guys make good guns. Whatever, that's great. I don't have any time on them. Um, you know, the Marine Corps is very happy with the M27. And early on, everybody's like worried about the saw being replaced. And the gunner and Sergeant Major from Weapon Training Battalion were telling, telling us, because I was always down there with State Department training, they were telling us, dude, this thing's going to kill the M16, not the saw. Really? I'm like, yep, it's our straight barrel that's free flow with good trigger, man. It's going to kill shit. Like as far as the piston, the great, the best thing about piston, especially in a hot, high op tempo unit, like we're all victims of our own frame of reference. Pat Rogers, Ding! we're all victims of our own frame of reference. Well, I go back to my days in the boat company. Whenever we would spend 12, 18 hours cycling up to do a raid, then we'd go get our ship pushed in for six to eight hours in the open ocean. Then we have to get to the beach and be tactically proficient conduct a raid, then get back to our boats, hopefully survive the surf passage and spend another six, seven hours getting back to our ship. Then we'd spend hours cleaning boats, gear, and weapons. Anything that can take time off that back end where we can actually get into our, like, our rest cycle is a win, dude. And being able to come back off of a mission and be like, hey, functions check it, yep, good. Going to go back to condition three, whatever you call it, whatever branch, wherever you're at, but bolt for an empty chamber on it and slam mag in, go to sleep, catch 15 minutes or take a shit, eat something, be ready to punch out the door again where you're not sitting there scrubbing shit off the fucking gun for an hour. That's a win to me, dude. I don't, I don't care if you can do like up team bajillion mag dumps out of it. I'm cool with it being like serviceable quickly and maximizing your downtime so you can refit and get some rest. True enough. Yeah, another Chuck, what are your oh. thoughts? I, I think that uh, I, I agree with Chad. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the M4A1 is a fucking 1911. But when you listen to they're made for both, um, Glock guys are like, I don't have to clean my shit. And 1911 guys are like, a properly maintained 1911 is absolutely reliable. 
and you hear a lot of those parallels between DI and, and piston gun people. Um, I, I don't think that a fucking M4 is as finicky as a 1911. Uh, I want to state that for the record, but I can count on two hands, probably, the amount of stoppages I had in my 416 in nine years. Maybe. Uh, I clean the gun once every... Like I, the handguard would not get pulled off of the weapon to expose the piston system and remove the gas piston and do anything to it until I was done with a deployment. When I would come back for a deployment, I was done, and so I would take everything apart because I knew they were going to pull the barrel to do all those fucking checks I talked about, so my zero was going to be shot anyway. Um, and I don't care if the if the Germans, you know, promise that you can put the damn handguard back on an M27 and hold your uh, PEC 16 zero within a minute of angle, which they do, by the way. Um, I, I don't I don't care if I take my hand, I'm fucking rezeroing my laser. Uh, like it or not, the the laser system, just due to the time of it, uh, is the most important of all of the sighting systems on the weapon. So uh, I basically ignored the entire operating system and the maintenance of said operating system for four to six months at a time. And then I would take it apart, solvent tank it, get everything out of there, uh, clean it up, and then hand it in to the armors. And it's possible that behind the scenes there was a lot of like little parts that were being replaced that I don't know about. But they would, and they'd be like, all right, hey, man, we swapped your barrel out. Your shit was hot dog down a hallway. Ah, okay, nice to know. Um, I got a new barrel on my gun. Or, hey, man, you, uh, you know, did, you saw that you had three locking lugs broke on your, on your bolt. Yeah, they started falling out like, you know, whatever, a few months ago. Um, you didn't think to get a new bolt? Nah, man, it's still shooting. It's good. Um, you know, so my shit looks like a West Virginia stripper. Fucking chicklets all busted out. Um, and it's all good. Uh, yeah, so I just didn't... It was a very carefree weapon system. I didn't have to worry about babying it, taking care of it. You know, oh, baby, let me look at your bolt. Can I hold on to the rim and pick you up? Does the bullet fall out? You know, all these silly things that we do with guns to, to do our own checks to see if they're running. I just... I never thought about it with an HK. It'd fucking add oil, add bullets. Fucking rinse, wash, repeat. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't fucking give one out to everybody uh, necessarily. That weight, weight is a thing. Um, you know, cost is a thing. Uh, you know, I, lo I love the fact that the Marines fucking backdoored the M27 in there. Uh, if you look at, you know, every other fucking country that had a uh, light support weapon, uh, let's see. Support weapon, Steyr Aug, light support weapon. Everybody that had fucking magazine fed light support weapons all carry mini me. So the entire rest of the world started out with fucking light automatic rifles and went to belt fed fucking light machine guns. And, and the Marines decided to go the opposite direction of that. But whatever. Congratulations on your Nazi guns, boys. Good job. Yeah, having, having worked for an SLT, we had an HK416, and while it didn't go through the exact same bullcrap that you put yours through, uh, we've got 30,000 rounds on, on one, and this thing's still running. Um, but I did talk to Larry Vickers, who was a consultant for uh, HK on the 416, and another big advantage to a piston system is um, it's less sensitive to dwell time. So you have a short barrel, say, under 10 inches, uh, it doesn't affect function as much as it would on on a uh, you know gas infringement gun, especially when you get down to like the eight inch PDW type, type guns. Well, no, that's that's less a of an issue in the military kind of world because we've got you know one or two, maybe three types of ammo you got to deal with, and it's good, all good hot rod ammo. Uh, so a lot of that stuff can be kind of dialed in. Uh, to the point, it's it's not a pain in the ass. That's kind of what you see at the Mark 18s. Is I wouldn't recommend that for normal people, but it seems to work well enough. But that's because they're running on M855 or 855A1. And, okay, well, we can play with 
we we know what it needs. We know the the ammo it's getting, so we can we can kind of narrow narrow that down a little bit and be it'd be happy. I'll tell you what, though, whenever I was working with LWRC a lot, I was pushing them once they started incorporating the regulated gas blocks. I was like, add more ports. Like, but we got one for suppressed and one for unsuppressed. I'm like, no, add more ports, man. Like, I'm thinking like Mag 58 shit. Like, give me like 47 <laughs> ports, dude. I'm like, ah, I want to go between 650 and 800. All right, cool. You fucking tune that thing in for what you shot, man. And then guess what they're doing now in their new Reapers? Like 97 fucking ports, whatever it is. I don't know. Don't quote me. They're not paying me anymore. Doesn't matter. Yeah, that but, was one uh, of the things that I hated about the 240 was they took away on the, the, oh the, like, God, the 240 dude. Lima. They took away the freaking ports, you took away the freaking adjustment, and they made it a fixed gas regulator. So you, oh, like the had saw, no way of adjustment. They gave yeah. it a mono block. It's a fix. They made it a mono. Yeah, they gave it the mono block on the 240 Lima. These motherfuckers need to be paying me, dude. Fucking retards. <laughs> well. Yeah. I, I don't know. Allegedly, according to the, 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 you know, Puzzle Palace at Picatinny, that's, that's, no, a, I don't, I don't want to go there. You know, the optimal solution. Yeah, I know. They'll, they'll make retarded, you dude. Punch oh, my God. <laughs> I only hear that from a lot of people uh, for some reason. <laughs> hey, <laughs> my, my, my <laughs> M249 used to have two gas settings. Now it only has one. Good job, uh, Picatinny. Dude, man, like, at state, we had like a mixture of barrels, dude. And I was like, we are not getting rid of them bitches, dude. That is our gold. Put those over there. Mm. Chad, got a That's question awesome. for you. Yeah, what you got? Chad, I want to know how often do you clean that gas tube? Gas in tube? Gas, oh, in a gas impingement gun. How often do you clean that tube? I've cleaned one. And it Out was... of how many thousands of weapons? Over 40,000. I cleaned one. One. And it was roughly 2000. It was late 2008. And it came back from the Moscow Embassy as a brand new M4A1. And they pouched it back, which is three grand one way. Um, probably shouldn't say that. Whatever. But they patched it all the way back. And uh, I get it. I'm like, what's wrong with this fucking gun? It's brand new. And the, t- the slip on says, gun don't work. And I'm like, what the fuck? Oh like, yeah, oh. I'm like, well, call call MSG and have them come pick up their M4 because I ain't fixing their shit. And they're like, well, no, just see what's wrong with it. I'm like, I LTI it, which is all visual functions. Check, like, nothing's wrong with the damn gun. I'm like, all I can do left now is test fire it. Like, and Fred was like, test fire it. So I went over next door to the FTU. I pulled out the bullet trap, eight hundred pounds of bullshit, roll it out there ten yards. I was like, fuck it, load up a, a fucking mag green tip. And I'm like, poof, get a face full of shit. And I'm like, yeah, goddamn. Oh, yeah, shit hit me in the face. My gun's still together. I'm good. And I look at the ejection port <laughs> and it looks like, it looks like an Al Sharpton, like fucking like troll doll is like, got his head sticking up out of the ejection port. I was like gray, like hair. What the fuck is that? So I, I remember Dean Caputo saying, hey, just cycle it. So tap rack, fire again, poof, more shit flies out, and there's more shit coming out. They have broken off a Q-tip in the gas tube. And, uh, yeah, cycle, hand, manually cycled it three times, and it blew out that whole Q-tip head out, completely out of the gun. Completely out of the gun. The only time you have to clean a gas tube is when some dumb fuck puts one of these in it. Yep. yep. This time it was an actual wooden Q-tip they broke off in there, and like, oh, God, yeah. don't work. And so that was like this. six thousand dollars to get that gun fixed, and I fired three me, rounds out of it. Let me ask this: hey. since we have some <laughs> experts here, uh, what 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 twist rate do you guys run in your gas tubes? <laughs> <laughs> um, one in fourteen. What do you everyone like? Tell me. Let me know. Uh, I, I had that conversation the other day. I've actually had to clean gas tubes, not from. Uh, you'd see it sometimes if if you take a, a just a normal gun and run a twenty two conversion in it for a long time, uh, without throwing some five five six down the tube, uh, you'll you'll get that whole gas block and gas tube uh, impacted with crud and lead and what and whatnot. And uh, usually it's just easier to swap the gas tube at that point. 
than it is to try and fish it all out. But a no, one I have in, seen eroded gas tubes, like ones that are just like blasted out. I've definitely seen those, but as far as cleaning them, that's the only one I've ever cleaned. But a one in 14 twist rate on your gas tube definitely increases lethality, no doubt about it. It's got to be counterclockwise because that's run counter to what the rifling twist is. It depends on what hemisphere you you're in. Dude, it's the hemisphere. <sighs> you, have to, you have to go that way with me on that. Damn it. Yes, you're right, Carl. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, this is one of those times where theory doesn't match up with science. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I think the idea of making a longer gas tube, wrapping the bitch around the barrel to get mid-length dwell time out of a carbine link system, like that shit briefs well. Somebody tell me why that doesn't work because science. Because, God damn it, the gas tube is as long as the mid-length one. How can I don't let me wrench on guns? Because that shit totally <laughs> briefs well. Because you would take a rifling gas tube and physically bend it around the fucking barrel. That's why. Now I'll get a pipe cleaner. Come on, man. <laughs> I'll mute myself. I uh, better stop. It's not the length I'm of the serious. gas tubes that is the deal. That's the that's what? the magic mojo. There is it's 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 how far that gas tube is out and how much more barrels out there in front of the gas port. Uh, yeah, you could you could make a three hundred foot long gas tube, and it's not. Well, that may not it's work. But, equilibrium. But, you know, it's, 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 yeah, you put a 12 inch, 12 inches of gas tube on a mid length gun, it's not going to be like a rifle. Um, because it's, you know, it's getting whatever, like 40,000 PSI gas shot up into it for, you know, X amount of microseconds versus, you know, 20,000 PSI at this flow through the bigger gas port and all that jazz. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there, and the, yeah, the short answer is, you know, the gas tube. I don't think the actual physical length of the gas tubes, uh, the critical, uh, the critical thing there. So what you're okay. saying is, gas tube length isn't the problem. You have to determine the right gas port size and gas port location for heavy and light flow days. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and here's and here's the deal. <laughs> if, if, okay, if 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 you're if you love pistons, that's great. Piston guns are great, but if you don't like DI. It's because you didn't drink enough stoner Kool-Aid, and you need to go back to the fridge. You need to pull out your stoner Kool-Aid. You need to chug that shit bottoms up, okay? Because stoner is a genius, right? We all know that. That's where the piston comes from, right? It's, a, it's a, an abomination from, uh, after stoner's legacy, right? But the, the, the DI, right, it's, it is like an internal piston. But the, the unique thing about it is that it's all in. So this is like the only firearm that's ever been designed with everything going on is in line. So you got the fucking bar the bullet goes down the barrel, the gas comes back, the gas chamber expands, and it's not offset, right? Like a piston is offset, like when you're describing uh, impulse, like recoil impulse. That's because your, your piston rod is offset, and because the, the stroke can be short or whatever. But on a TI, it's all in line. So the force is coming from within on the center line, then it recoils on the center line, ships off of fresh cartridge, yada, yada. But that's a unique thing. There's nothing else that's like that. So you get, you know, longevity. They're, they're different guns, you know, like the DI, it's got a lot of issues. Like maybe you run, you know, 10 inch, 10 three, especially if you run with cans, like uh, a can, and then you start getting gas port erosion. And then you get, um, you know, like, like peen, uh, peened um, rings, you know, on your um, cycling, and that's like a showstopper. And you do that, and you're totally fucked. And you're not getting out of that one. So, you know, I think it's got a lot of negatives to it when it when you modify it. Uh, but the original, you know, the original design is so uh, consistent and not, you know, like like everybody always wanted to fuck with it. Stoner's concept is more of like a simple rifle. More oh, uh, Dugan, you're you're breaking pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, you're coming in weak and effeminate. I'll grab that torch and run with it for a bit. I, I was I was talking about that <laughs> earlier. Uh, you know, maybe in terms of. Uh, the genius, I guess, of the of the whole the kind of the AR the AR ten AR fifteen um, is not so much in the gas and pigeon. That's kind of 
that's the means or that's that's just a consequence of trying to get everything uh in line there the whole recoil action all the operating well the bulk of the operating uh, forces and everything and the barrel all that the recoil the bore axis the operating axis are all in the same they're all right in line with each other you know and that's one of the reasons you know uh, aside from the the barrel extension setup which is again another another good spot. That's that's one of the reasons they're able to get away with the aluminum upper receivers, the aluminum lower receivers, and the you know the the aluminum uh, receiver extensions, because that shit was basically even under full like operationally load, basically just can float in there. You know you're not it's not bouncing around, it's not wearing heavily on the sidewalls of that. It's pretty much you're just keeping the only the only real like steel on aluminum where you you typically see it in ar is the is the cam pin um riding on the uh riding on the in, inside of the upper receiver because that's the only that's the only thing you're dealing with is when that's coming back and you know the only time you see any of that wear is when that that bolt hits the bullet and starts pushing that you start compressing that uh that bolt into the carrier and then you get a little bit of torque from that cam path and then that's where you see the uh, it, it wearing on the upper receiver. But other than that, it's float. It, it, it you know it's kind of free floating in that whole tube. Um, and that's you know that's kind of where the whole lightness thing comes from. Um, well, well don't, don't get me wrong, and you know people are, y'all wanted to know my opinions on on piston guns because I have a bit of experience with them. Um, absolutely respect the shit out of Stoner and his design. But what I just want to like offer as a counterpoint is that as brilliant as his design is and simplistic, um, he still has a round pin in a, in a square hole for one. That's just straight up middle finger and, and gunsmithing theory 101 right there. But also it has as its heart to the whole system, he has a set of three, three cent spring clip rings that if those things fail and they will fail, the whole gun shuts down. doesn't matter how brilliant his system is. It's the cheapest part is the most pivotal part of the system. And that's the glaring weakness of it. Um, the reason why the pissing guns have actually come to the forefront or did for a time was because the end usage end user usage words, Chad, use them. Um, whenever dudes like Chuck start slinging like a shitload of rounds and using them far outside the, the designer's intent of the weapon at high round counts and then crazy altitudes and shorter barrel lengths and like suppressors and all this other stuff is far beyond what Stoner could have ever envisioned for the gun. And so, you know, it comes back to that. You have three stamped gas rings that are the heart of the system that will shut it down guess what you can take your bolt with the bad gas rings and put on my piston gun don't fucking matter it's gonna run like a rape date because the heart of the piston system is higher end materials obviously more expensive pricey materials but it doesn't have it doesn't have the the tissue paper heart hate to say it but that that's what that's what a di gun has I love it. I'll run it. I'll run it any day of the week. I'll run it naked in fucking shower shoes. If I have to, I will do it. You better. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying you're fucking weak as shit if you have to use this gun. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that, real talk, that's the, that's the chink in the armor of the fucking AR platform of Stoner's Baby, is that it was designed 70 years ago, and he did not even know we were going to find these fucking savages right now in the type of conflict that, that Chuck's been fighting in for his whole entire adult life, right? Like we have pushed this gun far beyond his designer's intent, far well, beyond. I'll talk yeah, about that's what I got. the gas rings a little bit because I've had some experience in the engineering of gas rings. Um, you know, uh, and yeah, I kind of my biggest thing with that the touch on what you're talking about. I think the biggest the biggest downside is it gets dirty. Okay. All right, yeah, it gets dirtier than 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 most and than a lot of their stuff. You know, if there's anything you had to pick out, that's probably going to be it. Um, now, gas rings, yeah, you know, I think a lot of us have seen that. Uh, you know, 
a bro- not a new gun, but a well broken in uh, gun that's smooth and everything. Doesn't even need gas rings. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree. That's probably it's probably yeah. It's it's a weak link. All right, well, it's a potential weak link. It's not always the weak link, as it. But uh, you know, that's something I address. That you know, we were mess mess around with. Uh, uh, not necessarily for that reason of like you know blowing out a, a gas ring through wear and that what and what what really fucks you is when that that gas ring gets uh, blown out or peeled over and the whole thing seals up and you're fucked. You're gonna have to get a hammer and a screwdriver and like just wedge it in there and do all sorts of hinky shit because that bolt carrier is halfway back and you can't take the gun apart. Um, the uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I did at CMMG was, you know, okay, so we, we went to, you know, this kind of that Crane McFarlane style uh, helical gas ring. Um, well, that's great and all, um, but one of those things is like your standard gas rings are 303 stainless, which is just like ba- baseless, don't rust stainless. Um, and one of the things, you know, I did there was was switch to, uh, and I actually I don't know, I don't have it right in front of me, but like a, a 17.7 or a 17.4. Uh, precipitation hardened stainless, um, you know, which is going to wear is, you know, it's, it's a much harder, slower wearing ring. And then you've got the whole helical setup for, you know, whatever that's worth. It's, they don't, you can't peel them out essentially is, is just mechanically they're less acceptable to shit getting fucked up. Um, yeah, I'm picking up what you're putting down on that. And like, but the, yeah, you're right. It's, the it's seven a six two guns piece instead of a three cent piece. Yeah, and and when you look at like the the milestones, like what an armor is actually looking for. Um, you're looking at three to five thousand rounds, and those gas rings are going to have to be replaced. And you've got the bump test extend it, you know, extend the bolt face set it up. It should support it under its own friction. If not, yeah, bump yeah. it should fall more than halfway forward, right? Which is generally bullshit. I that's think, within in th- terms of yeah, the gun working, like, but whatever. Yeah, but I mean, but it. I'll tell you what, though, man, it's it's a narrow, narrow, narrow threshold. Whenever you got a gun that's like hot and burning off lube, it needs every extra psi of pressure retained back there to run it. And so, if the gun's getting dry and it's got weak ring, uh, weak uh, rings in it, it's going to choke sooner, you know. Um, but anyways, you know, the seven six two guns that are using that helical, or some of them are that are out there. Well, and and if most I'm, of them. Yeah, and one of the reasons for that is just from a manufacturing and supply source is most of the six the seven six two guns there wasn't a commercial off the shelf off the shelf like commodity part mm-hmm. uh, for these guys to buy. Like so, okay, so I'm kicking out a new seven six two gun. I well shit, I've got to make gas rings now. I can't just you know call up the <laughs> the gas ring guys and like give me a hundred thousand of these. I've got to actually you know come up with a print and get shit made. Um, so instead of stamping out and, and instead of, yeah, yeah, stamping out some big 308 gas rings. Yeah. I'm going to call up the helical wonder, uh, their, their internal or external, uh, ring retainers or whatever. And I'm going to call up the heel, the guys who do those helical ones, have them kick them out. Um, there's actually no tooling cost on it. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the flavor of the day and you can get it in a fancier steel and, you know, Shit. And, well, how many how many rings do you have to use if they just scaled it up for three away? Like they kept it just the same thickness material. Like you'd probably have to use like what, like nine gas rings on a three away. But like, it, you'd have to go like a heavier, heavier material. It is. I I could look at my I could look at some notes, but uh, yeah, most of them are still three, and I, yeah, they're a little heavier. Um, now, at least at least in the the kind of the SR twenty five uh, LR three hundred eight pattern, um, uh, lengthwise the bolt and the grooves for those and everything's not that far off from the five five six stuff. It's more of a diameter change. Um, now I can't speak to like the Armalite or HK or you know some of the other weirdo. Um, the weirdo Rock River Bushmaster 308s or anything, but the uh, the the LR 308 and SR 25 kind of pattern um, is is pretty is yeah is pretty the bolts are pretty close to uh, 
five five six lengthwise. Hmm. Now I'm curious. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> I don't even have it written down anywhere to go look it up. Are you guys ready for a tangent? What do we got? Barrel lining. Chrome, double chrome, melanided, vanilla, chocolate. <laughs> now, Hodge is using double chrome, right? Um, he's using FN secret sauce. Whatever that works, whatever that is, you know, they, uh, that's kind of an FN thing, so... Double chrome just means you put it through the wash twice. Yeah, that's... I, I, it's I, not I an actual measurement. Like the double thick 249 chrome stuff is <laughs> some ad copy bullshit. Um, I think most of the most of that is... A lot of that is more effing secret sauce than it is, um, you know... They do like have some secret double. sauce, man. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that, you know, in... Uh, uh, not only their chrome lining process and QC, um, because the QC, the FN's QC process and what they do there is why they've got sub MOA chrome line barrels, um, is because they figure out how to make a, an extraordinarily consistent process in, in chrome lining and able to weed out the bad the bad actors there, um, and that's how they can, you know, how they've got. Uh, you know, some bolt guns with 240 barrels in them and they're, you know, shooting ragged holes at 100 yards. Um, and, you know, and kind of that secret sauce, as I understand it, uh, it, it goes farther than just the chrome and the process. Some of that's down to the barrel alloy. Um, and some of the, and a lot of those, al the alloy they use is, is tweaked to play nice with their cord lime forwarding process. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of, it's and it's an entire uh, top to bottom kind of system. Everything's tuned and tweaked to to that, and you know, and that's why they're cranking out a million barrels a year for you know everything, right? If it's you know less than you know fifty caliber or smaller, there's a good chance it's got an FN barrel. You know, somewhere along the line, it's got an FN barrel sitting on it. Um, let's well, there's, well, there's nitride. I'll, I'll get on the nitride here in a second. Yeah. Cause I know there's a lot of conversation about that, especially what the differences are as far as life and overall performance. Here, here I understanding of the nitriding and I'm definitely a fan of it. Um, nitriding has been around about as long as chrome plating, if not longer. It's been used in the oil industry. It's been used elsewhere for a long, 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 long time. Um, and so you have a lot of shops that are offering their services now to the firearms industry. Um, and, and so it becomes a, a, a QA, QC issue. That's why you have people like doing things like, like putting a, uh, barrel extensions on and having them QPQ'd or whatever. And I, all kinds of goofy shit happening. Um, but when it's done right, that shit is legit, like legit, and it works. But it's, it, but it all comes down to the requirement and what people are asking their gun to do, and how are they able to actually certify that it was done properly and consistently. That's what I ran into while I was talking to a number of barrel manufacturers with one of our projects. Pretty much all of them. All the ones I spoke to agreed with nitriding as an excellent solution. However, very few of them were willing to put their name on the line because they weren't the ones applying the nitride process. So they would outsource it to a third party. And if it's done improperly, it can damage the barrel or worse. And so they were, they like it. They agree with it. They believe it has wonderful capabilities and qualities. But all of them were sort of leery about it um, without doing their own QC check after to see the end result. Um, so that's the problem with it from what I've been able to ascertain. And when it's done right, it definitely appears to be a really excellent thing. I will say that I wish the one company I wish would pick it up. And I honestly, I admittedly don't know why it's entailed with setting up that kind of operation, but I wish Robar would pick that up. 
because they'd do it right. They'd definitely do it right if they had it. I don't know if they even have room in their fucking shop space. I've been there in shop space a long time ago. But. So I, I guess at CMMG, they're, they started playing around with nitriding before I even worked there. And this was, uh, you know, 2006, 2007. And, yeah, people were doing it on pistol barrels. Um, you know, you know, Glock famously, you know, that's a nitrocarburizing process. Um, but there was a, there, <laughs> there's, there was a lot of learning that occurred um, over a couple of years there with how to do it and how to do it right. Um, you know, yeah. I think we were probably the first ones to figure out the barrel extension issue. Um, <laughs> and, you know, th- and that basically boils down to was, you know, is the, the alleys between the barrel and the steel were different or between the extension, and the steel were different. And, you know, they, ex- you know, um, okay, no, let's back up. So nitriding, what's nitriding? Um, the most common stuff you see on, at least in the purview of AR-15 barrels is a, a salt bath nitriding. Um, so typically in this process, they take, uh, the finished or the, you know, in the white barrel, uh, all to the finished dimensions. Uh, and then that goes into a big ass vat of boiling cyanide. So, and we're not, not like water with cyanide dissolved in it, just straight up cyanide salt boiling. So it's like running at like 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, barrels go in for whatever, you know, you know, recipe they've got barrels come out. Um, and then typically most of them are a a quench. Um, there's a quench process after this always. So it comes out of, out of, out of the salt bath at 1100 degrees and is dumped in, uh, into a, uh, uh, it, it parallels a bluing for it, but a, it, barrel, a li- it parallels bluing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a lye bath, sodium hydroxide bath. Um, so they hit that at like three, four hundred degrees, and yeah, the the quench the quench solution is the exact same solution in heat as as typical black oxide or bluing. Um, so uh, it's almost the nitriding from the process itself. That nice black color you get from it uh, is this kind of a happy accident. Um, it just sort of worked out that way. That wasn't necessarily um, when the process was just d- was developed. That wasn't necessarily a design goal there. That just okay. It's it's a nice, b- good, durable black. So okay, great. Um, now there's there's other there's other things where they'll take out and and mechanically polish uh, or like do a centerless grind or or some sort of um, of knocking down the edges essentially and requench, repolish, or just quint this back in the bath and quench again. Uh, that's where all like your your QPQ and like your differences between like tenifer and melanite and tougher right and all these other different trade names is kind of the the recipe of quenching and polishing and and the the you know the the salt bath itself. But it all is essentially the basic thing. Yeah, Jordan. So, uh, not to interrupt you, but to interrupt you, it to to go back to the point of like it's like a higher order, um, more drastic version of bluing. You're not just using like a caustic salt; you're actually using cyanide, right? Well, and you're doing the quench, and they're carding it, which is the polish. Like it's yeah. like on a larger scale, like crazier, more yeah, dangerous yeah. shit. And, what and, they're doing yeah, to, and, to get the barrels ready, and the cyan and the cyanide part of it is what 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 they're trying to accomplish is as uh, a little chemistry cyanides, uh, was it C and three or something? It's basically all we're talking all carbon and nitrogen, um, and that's what we're doing. We're nitrocarburizing. We're we're wanting to put carbon and nitrogen into the barrel, uh, harden that steel, and you know this process is essentially gives us a good case hardening. Um, so the 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 meaty part of the barrel is still, you know, kind of relatively soft and gooey and ductile. Um, but the, the, the candy shell, uh, is hard. So it's going to wear good. It's, you know, we're getting a, we're due to the, some of the effects of the nitrogen and carbon, uh, stuck into that steel. Um, we're going to see less corrosion. Um, I'm not exactly sure how big of impact that, uh, the, 
the bluing quench essentially does to the corrosion thing because bluing's worthless <laughs> from a corrosion and a corrosion standpoint. Um, so it's hard to it's hard to tell exactly. Um, so okay, so that's basically what we're doing. We're just putting a we're making a nice candy shell in the barrel. Um, the problems that runs into with uh, typical, you know, in the application AR fifteen barrel is yeah. If you do it with a barrel extension, that shit's going to get fucked. It's going to come loose. Um, you're actually going to end up probably annealing the, uh, the extension a little bit. You're going to take – it's it's hardened uh, at a higher temperature. So you end up actually softening um, the extension at typical nitriding temperatures. Um, you get weird shit. You know, sometimes they don't get cleaned well, and you've got nice – salty funk in it. That's not a real big deal. Uh, the big deal is barrel extensions. Um, yeah, barrel extensions. And the reason people do it more than anything else, don't let them sell you otherwise, is it's cheap. It is, it's, you know, it doesn't really, on an industrial scale, doesn't cost anything more than just a straight unlined, like, phosphate or bluing operation on, on the barrels. Um, and that's, that's why, honestly, that's why everyone moved to it. It was cheap. It was fast. Um, and it worked really, it worked really well. Um, so that's one of those things, as long as, as long as you're not like on this major outlier of hard and heavy wear on the barrel, it's, it's a great process. It's going to say it's a, it's a great value. It's, it, it wears long, it's corrosion resistant and it's inexpensive. Um, and generally doesn't, it doesn't, there's not, there's not a lot of secret magic voodoo that the, the guys turning the barrels and, and building the guns have to worry about. A lot of that's on the, on the nitriding vendor. Um, and typically those nitriding guys, that's all they do is this nitride stuff all day, all day. And that's the only thing the shop does. Um, because it's a, it's a big process. Like, uh, it's, it's to the point, like, I know, we would we would have our lots of barrels in between like lots of like suspension shafts and shit like that and they would have to like put like six hours of downtime between those lots just to change the temperature 100 degrees in that bath there's so much like thermal thermal inertia in that um so we're talking like you know the bath size were like the size of a small room or something like that um so yeah it's it's definitely I mean, you know, if it's if if you're not needing that that high wear, uh, long life uh, stuff, it's definitely probably the the more economical choice. You know, yeah, chrome lining's great. Uh, you can build it nice and thick and get a long, you know, a long life out of that. And you know, dealing with your throat erosion and just barrel life. Um, but if you're not trying to get a barrel to go thirty or forty thousand rounds. And still, you know, still pass a uh, throat gauge. Uh, nitriding's, you know, definitely the way to go. I, in in my opinion. And we'll bounce it back to you guys, and we'll can explain more if you need to. Carl, do you need to take off? Yeah, I'm running up against a hard wall. I'm sorry about that. I um, hopefully I provided some interesting input in the time I was here. Before you take off, anything that you need to add or mention? No. Not really. Her, her um, projects. Same ones we had last time. We're still working on the What Would Stoner Do project. We have a big update coming out about that. We have some um, um, realignment of some of our priorities of how we're designing the rifle. Rifle versus the uh, the door kicker, we're calling it. So that's coming. We've got some vlog stuff coming on that. We've got a whole series of hard as hell two gun videos coming out, which if people are interested in that side of the things, it's going to be a, a, a shit ton of that. Um, so no, not really. Just more of more of the same, but a, but an evolution of it. And if you're not watching in in range TV already, please start. <laughs> That's what I got to add. Hopefully, I'm sorry that I have to drop out a little early. I know that we have another cool topic coming up on here that I know that's uh, interesting to me. But um, I'm running up against my own wall right now. So I appreciate yeah. you cutting in on that. Hopefully, well, I can come back us. again in the future. No, oh yeah, please yeah. invite me back. I'd love to be here. So thank oh, you yeah. guys. All right, I'll be checking out this next topic myself later because I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Thanks can, you hold that rifle? Can, you, can you hold up What's that rifle that? one more time that you held up earlier? The 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 uh this one? Yeah, Which one? I just wanted you to pimp your shit one more time, dude. Oh <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. 
little yeah, bump this is set like, spike. Yeah. Yeah, this is our door kicker gun. This gun, in its current configuration, weighs five pounds, six ounces with the sight and the laser system and light. So it's pretty awesome. Need to get him a mall on that shit. That's where Chuck comes in. <laughs> so thanks for cutting in. I'm sorry I have to drop out a little early, but keep going, guys. It's been fun, and hopefully I'll join you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Shall we continue on chrome lining and nitriding? We can. This shit's awesome, though. I will say that. And they use it on a, like, a lot of tools and stuff already. Like, it's great stuff. Well, and, and you know, some of the, some of the nitride uh, kind of falls into the same category as MEM does, too. Um, it is not... You, that's where you can get in trouble is just m using it as the universal solution. Um, and it's not always going to be that, you know, if something's, you know, if you've got a part that's extremely hard, nitrate's not going to be an option because you're going to cook out, uh, that hardness. Um, you know, if you've got some thin, if you've got real thin stuff, no go, it's going to end up being too brittle. You know, you got something 30,000 thick and you're nitriding. So you're going to have, you know, that hard candy layer, you know, five ten thousandths on each side you know you're you're not gonna have any you're not gonna have any that good ductile uh durable steel left essentially and you're just gonna have the thing crumble to pieces um yeah it's I've entirely seen, dependent on your base materials yeah there's definitely some there's definitely some material and heat treat and, and the greater like surface hardness and surface finish concerns that that, that bake into that um you know one of the one of the the other things you see with nitriding is uh, if you're nitriding uh, truly stainless steels, so like your 300 series stainless and your like 17.4s and 17.7 precipitation hardened ones, um, you may actually see uh, a decrease in corrosion protection from it. Um, you're going to see some, you know, you're going to be able to get some hardness in your 300 series steels, which you normally is kind of hard to do. Um, it's probably not going to do anything other than make, you know, like a 17 four part black, right? Um, now, like your stainless gun barrels, uh, which are typically like 410 or 416 or some extra sulfured 416, um, it's probably beneficial because 400 series that's used on gun barrels, the 400 series stainless ain't stainless. Um, it will rust, um, it will get funky on you. Um, so, you know, there's probably a lot of benefit, actually, in, in nitriding uh, um, 400 series stainless uh, barrels. In, um, in, talk, in talking to the talking about the barrels, um, with the old management at the rifle company, we were talking about it, and it was actually um, that annealing threshold with the process actually helped with barrel manufacture where if you had to worry about possible hardness, spot hardness issues or whatever, sending it off to get it, you know, nitrocarburized or whatever you want to call it. Um, it actually brought it back. It brought back some elasticity, some flexibility back to the steel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're, you're doing another, you're giving it another, you know, like a Neil, another heat hardness. cycle. Yeah. You're cycling it again. And yeah, you, you, you can definitely, you know, see some of that, you know, and, and you, you see some, you know, some stress relief in it too. Um, anytime yeah. you're thermal cycling like that. Um, so, you know, and I think some of the precision guys out there have kind of figured that out for their stainless barrels that, okay, we can nitride them and they're going to last a little longer. Um, because it was hard, to, man. Yeah. We're able to get some hardness into that stainless. And that's one of the reasons, you know, you see stainless used on match barrels so often is not because there's anything, uh, inherently accurate. Nope. Uh, with it's just stainless easy steel machine. Versus <laughs> it's easier for them, the machine. So they're able to make a, you know, make a better, the bores cleaner and better and cuts and is smoother. <laughs> Everything the the, the, it's, a, it's a lower threshold of like quality, the achieve the quality needed. Um, mm -hmm. to get an accurate barrel. Um, so yeah, it opens some doors up there. Um, but like I said, it's not the end all be all. You can't just like, Oh, let's nitride all the things and it's going to work out. I think, I think the newest thing or what's going to be the newest thing if somebody can crack the nut on it is cladding. 
explosive cladding of barrels. If they can actually make it like cost effective to do that, you can get some real exotics. You can get that. You could actually get that Stella line fucking well, five, five six we, barrel we with the aluminum oh, yeah. sleeve on it. There's a lot of it <laughs> looking looking for like uh, like cobalt alloys, which are like your stellites. Um, you know, throwing you know high nickel, high chromium stuff on there like hast alloy and in, in canal. Um, where you, you probably don't want to make a whole barrel out of it, but it'd be nice to be able to get that shit on there. Uh, a thin coat of that on there in the wear areas without, you know, having to work too hard at it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ready for the next one? Sure. Okay. Here it is. Need to crack my knuckles and get into this one. Forward assist. Personally, I'm not a fan. I don't see a use for it. There's a little divot in there in the uh, in the bolt that I can manipulate things with. Mike? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> well, the M16 didn't have a forward assist. The M16A1 did. With modern advancements, I don't know. But I know I want one because when shit goes bad, shit's really bad. Can I p- potentially reach out and manipulate with my finger? Yeah. But it's a whole lot easier to slap the shit out of that Ford Assist and, and get the bolt into battery. Um, again, I don't know. I want one because when shit's bad, shit's really bad. But is it a real need? I, I don't know. I'll defer to Chad on that one. What about the potential of making the matters worse by jamming things even further, making the malfunction even more, more, more final? It, it depends on the stoppage. You know, my, my experiences has been, I want my gun up, either my gun's up or my gun's not up. And if my gun's not up, it's time to transition. It's time to get a battlefield pickup whatever you need to do to keep going. But if the gun's down, it doesn't matter whether it's down because it's down or if it's down because I exacerbated something that it was down already. That's just my opinion. Chuck, we haven't heard from you for a little bit. If if you're still here. He's probably asleep. He's probably I'm mixed. Letting the dog out. <laughs> I, I'm I'm mixed on my uh, Ford Assist setups. Um, a lot of my ARs don't have them. Some of them do. Um, gener- I think generally speaking, uh, probably not necessary. I'm a th- fan of just throwing the thumb up there in the divot and pushing it home if it, you know, for whatever reason doesn't quite close all the way. If I ride the carry handle or something like that. Um, now I do I do have a Ford Assist in my 300 Blackout, um, just because I I figured that was going to be a case just with uh, you know if I'm ever shooting a subsonics of goofy long bullets or something, it's it's more likely than you know a typical 556 five, setup that I may have to may have to do do something there. Um, yeah, I'm with I'm the Air Force and Armalite and Colt and everyone didn't seem to think they needed a forward assist. That was some, that was some general or a couple of generals in the big army that kind of ran that through it. And everyone was like, well, okay, whatever you guys are paying the bills. Um, you want a forward assist? We'll give you a fucking forward assist. And that's basically what they ended up with. You know, uh, Stoner and Springfield had a few different ways of doing it that had they been able to make it as robust would probably have been ergonomically a lot better. Um, uh, but you know, the development timeline wasn't on there is like, as soon as someone got that shit welded on there onto the side of the receiver and something stuck in there, it's like, okay, yeah, we're going with that. Um, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and you got to remember a lot of stuff happened in, in, a in a time span of a, you know, a year or two, um, you know, from when we were going from like M16 to like M16 E1. Uh, and some of those other ones into the into the A ones and fielding that shit was a, I mean it was full on fucking war time. So they were they were you know changing shit every other day um, and just going to town there. So 
you know, maybe, maybe had they given it some more thought and a little bit more time to stew on it, we would have maybe ended up with a better solution or something, but uh, it's what we got and it kind of stuck with it. Chuck, what do you think? Forward assist? Do you need it? Um, I think you do. Um, I don't think it hurts anything. You know, it's not like an M249 fucking magazine well. I mean, there's no downside to having it except for potentially a fucking snag hazard. Uh, and as much as I love fucking Hodge, one of the complaints that I have about uh, the Hodge defense upper was the teardrop fucking Ford Assist, which when I saw it, I was like, fuck yeah, old school nom throwback. And then like I immediately realized why we got rid of that fucker for a small little round one, because I hung it up on everything. Um, I got damn near pulled a fucking charge off the door a few months back uh, and I've talked about you guys know the deal with my fucking good mate fucking noner um, pulling the charge off the door uh, is not where you want to be um, so yeah teardrop is a snag hazard uh, they always seem to be fucking steel constructed and therefore uh, they rust more um, so there's a lot of things that they don't do really good, but it doesn't really hurt nothing. And I have had to push some shit forward. And I, I just, you know, when we talk about the dirtiest, slickest fucking bolt carrier out there, you know, we're all talking about, you know, run them dirty, run them dirty. I mean, if the thing is covered in black oil and it's hot as shit, um, Am I really wanting to put my thumb on the side of the bolt carrier to apply forward pressure to, to get the thing to seat? Um, first gun, the first battle rifle I ever saw without one was the G3. And we were out in fucking Norway, and it was cold as balls. And all the fucking oils were all going, you know, semi-solid. And, you know, I'm watching these Germans, and if anybody's ever given the old downward whack on a fucking charging handle release thing on an AK weapon that is a very strong and positive cut chunk going forward and 62 fucking guns failing to go on a battery because uh, it's you know negative 90 Fahrenheit or whatever the fuck we were in and uh, and it was a problem negative 9 and, and, <laughs> Sorry. yeah exactly like I, I, I'm not exactly sure how cold it was but imagine the Norwegian Winter Olympics and then go 400 miles north of where they did the Winter Olympics. And that's where we were. Um, so, you know, and the Norwegians are like, yeah, we just take this thing and push it in the thing, you know, with their AG3 fucking assault rifles. And I'm like, yeah, man. You know, if you guys just had a forward assist, you wouldn't have these fucking problems. Um, and not saying that our Colts fucking chambered any more positively, but uh, at least we had a forward assist to get them to close under extreme fucking... Whatever. So that's my take on it. It doesn't fucking hurt. Am, am I sold on it? Is it the end all be all? Nah. But, uh, you know. A little bit, a little bit of trivia. Those, uh, those uh, teardrops on the Hodge guns, I did those. And they actually ended up, uh, uh, now that I think about it, snaggier than, uh, than the, the old school, the old school ones because the, uh, the original like A1s uh, were kind of had kind of a little bit of round roundness on them and were cast. Um, and these are all the ones Hodge I did for Hodge were all uh, kind of sharp, made out of, like completely billet. Um, so yeah, they're probably a little snaggier than than even the old school A1 style. They they look exactly like it, and they're basically the same. They're just a little beefier and and and, uh, and billet there. Um, now, dude, they're things... a throwback as shit. I, I, I loved them from that standpoint. Like when I saw it, I was like, "Fuck yeah, Hodge, fucking did that shit. This is awesome." You know. And then, like, I went and used it operationally. I was like, eh, "Well, yeah. this would be, <laughs> yeah. this would be so much better at a three gun match right now, not you know, with a bomb wrapped around it." But whatever. Well, it, 
the the only downside I've ever encountered really with the the forward assist is um is the mill spec and the bulk of them out there the the pen that that holds the paw that engages the book hair is this this dinky one sixteenth uh, uh, roll pen. If you ever break that, your shit is fucked, fucked hard. If you manage to break that pen and that and you cycle that thing and that paw just jams in between the the upper receiver and the carrier, and yeah, it's time to get out the hammer. You might have to get a Dremel out just to just to free that thing to get the gun apart. Um, I have seen that happen. Um, and I think solid pens are, and, or little heavy duty. Well, as heavy duty as you can get a 16th, uh, coil pen is the name of the game on that part, because, uh, that's, you know, another one, like the gas rings we were talking earlier, a couple cents there can really fuck you. See, that's yeah. all good to know. Gun shit. Like when you see accessories and, and, um, you don't understand engineering risk that's being assumed for potentially marginal gains, then, then it's easy. Like you, when you asked an, un, an uneducated person, like you like forward assist and you're like, why the fuck wouldn't you put one on the gun? Like it doesn't hurt anything. Well, maybe, it, maybe it could, <laughs> you know, maybe it could hurt something like catastrophically lock up your shit. Eh. I remember Pat Rogers bringing that up specifically as one of the weak points yep. where it, yeah, it can induce a, mal, a major malfunction. I don't know if it's uh, catastrophic, seen, like what Cowan's been saying about XDs, but I was seeing a, a primer get lodged inside the pole. So it engages the bolt carrier and the shot was fired and it blew the fucking whole assembly out. Um, the, uh, personally firsthand I've seen witness shooters actually where we did not incorporate using the forward assist for the initial loading procedures. I've corner of my eye. I saw a shooter giving it the old, you know, giving it the choke a few strokes. And I was like, mm, that doesn't look right. So I called a stop on the line, walked down there. I'm like, Hey, go ahead and download your gun. He's like, well, I'm just do me a favor. Download your gun. Broke it down, shotgun style, pulled the bolt carrier, looked through there, and he had a squid that he was crush fitting around into. Because we were going from frange to green tip the next day, then to frange, and you know, back and forth from day to day. You know, it's just being able to palm strike around in a battery. If it doesn't want to go in a battery, it probably doesn't need to go in a battery. Um, what I use on, on two of my primary guns that are suppressed all the time, my Ford Assist is gone, and I've got the AR gas vent in its place, and it works 100 times better because of it. And that's all I use it for. Well, another way, you know, another one in a million way, um, you can – it kind of goes back to earlier. If you ever, like – for whatever reasons got that forward assist up against like a barricade or something. I don't know mm -hmm. what kind of weird ass situation that's going to fall into, but if you've got that thing forward and you shoot, you're breaking shit. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to, you're it's, it's, it's going to break, it's going to break that roll pin or just blow out something else before it just kicks yeah. it out. It, 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 it could get fouled up theoretically. Yeah. yeah it could get fouled up and depressed. Yeah. Well, I've I and I I bring that up because I've seen that shit get broke because of that. Not to say mm -hmm. that's probably that you know one in a million is probably about right. Maybe one in ten million kind of situation there, but you know. No, I I, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, I have seen some fucking hokey shit uh, <laughs> in and around fucking corner clears, man. So, yeah, I could absolutely see somebody overcommit to a fucking corner and then decide they were going to lean backwards and fucking brace their fucking AR off their forward assist for a fucking barricade firing position in a house. Yeah. I could, well, I'm I mean, visually watching it happen right now before I could throw <laughs> a can of Monster and an air horn at them. Yep, and it, I see it. It's one of those things. It's like, yeah, if we could like make a better Fuck. forward assist, that'd be a good thing to look at. Is do the same thing they had to do with the magazine release, 
and 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 build a fence around it a little bit just to keep from inadvertent bump and bullshit from jamming that thing forward or you know dropping your mag in the, in the case of that actually you could actually put it in a beaver tail inside the the grip so you could just squeeze the grip harder to put it in a battery like a 1911 or an xd well and you know that's like what stoner and springfield wanted to do was build it into this magical bullshit in the into the uh, charging candle, which Magpul kind of went on later to do, and you saw that kind of manifest in the in the Masada and the ACR, um, where you know when the bolts forward, charging handles forward, it's all good, it's acting like normal. But if that uh, the the bolts not completely in battery, and you pull that charging handle back, now that charging handle's got a little ratchet paw on it. And it's it's acting as a forward assist. You push forward on that charging handle until that thing's in battery, and then it kicks the kicks the little ratchet paw of the way, and everything's back to normal. Um, so it's just kind of a magic thing where where normal operation it's non reciprocating, actually it's like a normal AR. But if that bolt's back and needs to be forward, you pull that back, and push forward, and it's acting like a forward assist. And that's what they tried to do in the sixties. It just wasn't as robust. Um, or would have required too many, too big of a change to the gun, um, mm -hmm. to, to implement. Um, and they didn't have EDM. Oh. Yeah, I think I think what what ended up is they would have had to change that that uh, the inner keyhole of the upper the the keyway the upper receiver make that taller. And we nowadays we probably would end up something that was like our M4s would be like a four sixteen upper and are a little taller. Um, well, shit. Might as well put a piston in it then. But uh, yeah, because you, I've I've been down this road, and it's like, yeah, you need a little extra height in that upper receiver to pack all that shit in there and not have it all janky. Or you could go with a foul side charger. You know, you someone actually brought that up. Knuckle bust and bullshit, and and hanging up on your kit and taking it yeah. out of battery. Good thing you got a Ford assist on that shit. Yeah. yeah someone was asking if we could discuss side chargers. Oh, that's too kind of weird. No, it's like, that's silly. Wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> we might as well talk about shotguns. It's gamer okay. shit. Get you killed in the streets. I like right. side chargers. It's I want to do it. <laughs> there he is. I, I think I think undercharging is the way where it's at. I want like a or like a not shitty like version a... of the rising, and just like I want to, I want my hand on that, or just I want to, like I want that pump action. The the pump action AR. Somebody's got one. Yeah, you put a semi-auto one, right? I just want to be like, oh shit! Well, we need to deal with you know, I need to deal with this, and it's both hands on the gun. I'm not having to you know do all this shit. No hand jive. Yeah. No secret handshake. Oh God. Oh well, and this kind of brings me to something else. It's like you know, uh, we've been kind of dancing around the idea of you know, uh, what, you know how how do you make the AR better? You know, right? And that's something the Marine Corps and SOCOM is definitely hot to trot on right now. Um, it's funny they all want the same thing, and it's uh, yeah, make it better. But... Throw it in the trash. <laughs> Take the AK Pro. <laughs> oh God! Just if it's got guys lay on it, put it on the gun. That'll get you pretty close. Well, and that's 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 basically what they're looking at is a fourteen five mid length, uh, you know, thirteen inch rail or thirteen inch handguard with M lock and. It seems they still want kind of like uh, you know a couple inches of uh, M1913 at the you know at the front end uh, hard on there um, you know some fancy bullshit slick shit in the uh, bolt carrier group uh, one to eight you know scope on there and a, and a silencer and let's go to town. I think yeah, they I'm should not... just ditch ditch the conventional weapons and just go to um, all IEDs and EFPs. You know, and just beat them at their own game. That works. I was going to see, like, E-tools and edged weapons and fucking cue balls and socks and shit. Yeah, just go full Starship Troopers with just bombs and flamethrowers. <laughs> Fuck guns. Okay, ready I for the next one? I think suppressed 14 and a half inch guns is a bad idea. 
and I think that a glass for a fucking 14 and a half inch M4 being employed by a fucking modern service member. But I'm out, so I don't give a fuck anymore. Deuces. <laughs> you say that. All right, I still care. Yeah. Go on Fort Bragg once a week and give Joe a hug. <laughs> Before we went live, uh, we discussed an article, and I think it was Mike brought it up. Was it you or was it uh, Ray? Ray actually brought it up. It was a two-part thing. Um, There was an article that came out a week or two ago about congressional hearings with with their asking for a new rifle. Um, along with that, one of the gentlemen that testified, a retired major general, had written an article about four or five months ago that was in a magazine talking about the problematic M16 M4 family of weapons. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> are we talking about Bob Scales, the Fox News contributor? That would be him. So can't we just all run around screaming fake news, fake news? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me get my Antifa fucking outfit on. Fake news, fuck news, fake news. Ah! Well, the unfortunate thing anyway, is sorry. Yeah, not in front of Fox News. It's in front of Congress, this, this latest escapade. Uh, fake Congress. Sorry. Yeah. You, know, you know, I'll repeat what I said. <laughs> I'll repeat what I said before we went live. You know, if if there is if there's a better mousetrap that we can get better lethality in the hands of our our service members, sure, yes. If there is a, an emerging threat that gives us a capabilities gap, yes, we need to bridge, bridge that gap. But the problem there is the M4, the published effective range is 500 meters. But if you go out on any range on Fort Bragg, Fort Campbell, Fort Carson, wherever, and you look at soldiers being trained, soldiers qualifying, they're trained to 300 meters. And to qualify, quote unquote, expert, 36 hits out of 40 exposures, they, they can get that without hitting a single target at 300 meters. So we've got kids that are scoring expert hitting targets between 50 and 250 meters with a 500 meter gun that will reach further, but that's a published effective range is a 500 meter gun for a point target. And now we're asking for an intermediate cartridge, six to seven millimeter on a 600 meter gun. And there's a training gap there. If it does no good to have a 600 meter gun when Joe can hit to a marginal standard at 250. So I think we need to fix the training. We need to do a dot mil PF, you know, rundown. And if there if there's a gun that needs to be developed or a gun that needs to be fielded, yeah, absolutely bridge that gap, give them better lethality, whatever. But it doesn't matter what you put in their hands. If they're not trained, they ain't gonna hit shit. Amen. I think it'd be- Yeah, I don't- you first, E9. Or Spec 9. I, could, I don't subscribe to any fucking lethality that increases the soldier's load at this point. I just... I, and I would go into any House Select Subcommittee for appropriations and fucking sit them down and make them watch fucking Faulkner 360 or whatever the fuck and just watch, make them watch Afghanistan videos of soldiers and double dogs alike just waving their fucking optics somewhere within a foot and a half of their face while they rapidly press the trigger on semi-auto as fast as they can and then execute speed rifle reloads. And I want them to fucking tell me that they really want to fucking double the soldier's load weight for fucking individual ammunition after watching our soldiers actually employ their weapons in combat. It's fucking insane. At this point, I'd almost fucking rather they go with five sevens or four sixes since they can't hit anything anyway. They might as well shoot bullets that fucking weigh less.
Now I'm thinking so, about a backpack fed P90 and how awesome that would be. <laughs> I was about to say something about 5.7. So hey, don't fuck around. Hey, don't fuck around. SOCOM has already bought P90s to fucking break apart, reverse engineer, and stick on Iron Man's fucking wrist. Oh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, shit yeah, you yeah, not. No. The, the, the Talos and the mini P90s. Oh, no, yeah. I'm, I'm game. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm, it was all funny until the purchase order went through. And my buddies from FN are like, you know what happened? We sold SOCOM as fucking P90s. They're at the fucking lab right now, breaking them apart and putting them on Iron Man's wrist. Yeah. Well, have they figured out how to kill anybody with that cartridge yet? <laughs> is that part of the Iron Man fucking? No, is that part of the Iron Man evolution? No. I don't know. Yeah, no, 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 they no. got to yell "tickle fight" when they shoot it. Like, no, no. We'll, we'll just, you, you, you have the computer take over the arm oh. and just fucking aim bottom and new mag dumps into dudes' head, foreheads and there you go. <laughs> Unless fucking hey, unless FBI is doing all the ballistic testing in a fucking clinic at Fort Hood, I really don't want to see anything having to do with fucking five seven lethality anywhere. <laughs> Too soon? Probably not. No. <laughs> that go, that, yeah, that goes into my whole like trying to figure out my uh, space gun bullshit. One of these days. We're going to be, somebody's going to be jumping out of some little tin can from, you know, from fucking space and somewhere. And, you know, <laughs> the guns are going to have to support that shit. So they're going to be shooting P90s? Well, you know, they shoot from normal space. guns. But the, the, problem, the problem with space is lube is, you know, you get up there and, <laughs> in, 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 hard, in hard vacuum <laughs> and all your lube's computer. going to boil off. You're just gonna have like. <laughs> I'm sorry. The problem with space is lube. <laughs> yeah. That's hey, what? Viscosity and cohesion versus adhesion. You got you well, guys like globules it. floating around or anything. Oh, dude, I got it in my fucking mouth and went in the <laughs> eye. Like you know, <laughs> fucking terrible. Yeah, well, terrible. you know that's. Gonna it's be like that. fucking. <laughs> It's you know, like a lefty shooting a fucking Mark 18 on full auto with a surefire <laughs> can. <laughs> like, that's pretty much what being in space with Lube is like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. And the, the, the unfortunate thing is, is, is uh, you know, it's the same thing with, with shit without proper, proper toilet training in space, too. It tends to go <laughs> everywhere. <sighs> so, just described the, the P90 on Earth, too. Or as well, <laughs> it's like shitting in space. Like super troopers in space, man. That's what I'm right now. Dude, oh yeah, my I, god! I read can a, you book, am- a, a book about just like one of the big chapters was taking shits in space. Essentially, like, well, fuck! If I ever get to go, if if I ever get to go to space, I'm taking some ammonium, and we're not going to be up there very long because <laughs> this, this is just not something I'm willing to. I'm I'm willing to dance. <laughs> I'm like shitting in the blenders and shit, and it's like no, no. They are gonna like do like ground test, and they have like they've put like cameras in the bottom of toilets to so you can evaluate your 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 aiming. You've got to like get to a certain a certain amount of like ass certain attitude before they'll fetch you lose. So you like, laugh, but there's some rich white kid fucking fully airsoft out. Drive in a fucking brand new fucking uh, Range Rover to the fucking airsoft field. What did your dad do? Well, my dad created the Auto Suck 9000. <laughs> <laughs> What's an Auto Suck 9000? It's the apparatus on the space shuttle that allows everybody to go number two. <laughs> you, like, you like my Range Rover? <laughs> you laugh at that, but before they had the 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 vacuum blender, is it was just doing it in bags. And then you had to like squirt germicide in there, knead it all up, so the bacteria wouldn't build up gas and explode your shit bags all over the uh, the space. <laughs> At least oh, know. basically the United States Marine Corps and Anbar Province. Yeah. six yeah. years after they took over. Yeah, I know well. <laughs> and. You know, that happened. They had exploding shit. You can't get shit. away from the shit bags. They always catch up to you. <laughs> they figured out that hey. the hard way. <laughs> shit started exploding in the, in the Gemini capsules, I think. That was their problem was the shit exploding. 
Hey, Marine, why don't you have porta potties? Sergeant Major, all the porta potties are V beds. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I guess it's kind of hard to get a fucking contract to suck the poop out of your toilets when they're all filled with ammonium nitrate coming in the gate. So, <laughs> struggle's real. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my god. That's a great rabbit trail, man. I know. We went to the moon and back to fucking Ambar Province. Fucking <laughs> Oh, oh chat just exploded. Yeah. I think they they just went to the moon. So okay. Oh, Calvin's back. back. Now we can't talk about him. But, uh, you know, that's it, it, some more uh, book recommendations. Part of that uh, what I was getting at is, uh, what is it? Mary Roach's uh, Packing for Mars is about, you know, uh, all the literally shitty parts of going to space and whatnot. And she actually has a newer book called Grunt where she just kind of tromped around in an attic for for uh, a couple weeks asking weird questions, and that's a good one, too. Uh, same sort of stuff, all the nitty-gritty, dirty shit no one ever thinks about. You know, half the book, and, you know, some of you guys may have know some about this, was, you know, was dealing with, you know, <laughs> the the war stories of diarrhea studies and di- Digibooty and whatnot, but it's a real problem. <laughs> Djibouti. So do you guys you know, have what? Well, I was just gonna say, oh, yeah. You know, I think weapons development would be like totally different if we got rid of like the two, three labs that do it all already and have been screwing it up for so long, and we just like gave that shit to NASA. Like if DOD just said, "Hey NASA, y'all figure out their new rifle," well, what you- they come up with? You see, you, you see that now. So you've got like what you know, Picatinny's taking it over from everybody, and, and I guess what Aberdeen too, and you know, before that you had Springfield Armory doing that shit, and it was just bureaucratic bullshit, fuck ups after one after another, and thank God some dudes in a garage out in California came up with the M16 or. God only knows what weird ass broke ass, you know, broke shit we'd be running around with now. Probably have wood stock still. Or an Ste- FAL. Steel and wood. Just like from the last discussion. Okay, got one more topic. Unless something else get. comes up. Let me pull this up. The courtesy of Mike. So I don't know if this, let's see here. There it is. I don't know if everyone can see it. I hope so. I can't see it. What? How oh, about shit. now? Shooting off the mag. Not a problem. Mm-hmm. Not a problem in the least. Somebody lied. That hurts reading it. Generally not a problem. Uh, from what I understand, that was an M14 problem. Because you had a, a wood stock that would flex and stuff. And as you put pressure on the mag, you're putting pressure on the stock and changing the distance between the mag and receiver and causes kind of feeding issues and stuff. Yeah, the M14 stock, period. So yeah, was that was shit. just, is you, that the, you absolutely uh, could not touch anything other than the trigger to make it go back. Is that the, uh, the old manual or is that? Uh, no, that's the current manual for those that had trouble reading it. The highlighted section. This is page 6-24 of TC3-22.9. It says, note, the magazine can be rested on the ground while using the prone unsupported position. Firing with the magazine on the ground will not induce a malfunction. Uh, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought it was saying the other way. Other way. Okay, was like, uh, no. I would add a, a, an asterisk to that and say, if your weapon chokes while doing this, Shit can your magazine. It's a bad magazine. It, usually it's a magazine issue, and that's, that's you know, the, the struggle right now is just trying to get rid of all the freaking old magazines and ensure we have the, the current ones for our weapons. 
um, the black and the green followers, we, we, we still encounter them out there in the forest and just trying to make sure that they get uh, disappeared so that we get the, the appropriate magazines is in maintenance. Just trying to get a gauge, a feedlip wear tool for the, the magazines has been a struggle with Picatinny. They don't understand the necessity for it. Mm -hmm. Dudes are like totally like loyal to their magazines. Like, uh, like, I see dudes, like, growing up to our courses that have had the same magazine since they were in the fleet. And it's, like, the gold anodizing on the outside, black follower. Oh, this magazine's always been awesome. It's never failed me and shit. Like, all right, well, let's actually put some ammo in that thing and shoot it. Like, oh. Like, dudes are really loyal to their magazines. Amazingly, like, loyal to their magazines. And to quote Pat one more time, don't fall in love with your magazines. Yep. There, we've been talking about Pat a lot today. He's here. He's here right now. It was only a year ago that y'all yeah. were babysitting my drunk ass. What? Yeah. Well, should we Fuck. wrap her up? <laughs> I don't know. I think everyone's falling asleep. <laughs> I got. I got something cool. What do you got? Cool. It's the uh, well. A it's not. Spinner. It's not like new, new, but it's new for me. But it's the uh, Vortex Recce, the eight power monocle. This thing's a shit. Can I put and, it behind a Neotag? Do what? No, it's it's a handheld monocle. It's actually got a uh, clip for it, so you can stuff it in the pocket. But um, yeah. It actually has ocular diopter adjustment for your eyeball. It's got a ranging Milrad reticle in it, but it's eight power. They've got like an, a 15 power bigger version of it called the Recon. But yeah, the, the eight power is the shit. I've, been, I've used it in two courses now, running with shooters, spotting form at, you know, shooting at distances that's like 200 and past. Thing's pretty clean though, dude. It's awesome. It's good for like spotting lanes before you pick up your rifle to look, you know, through your main optic if you're like moving around through the brush. Good piece of kit and it's not terribly expensive. I got my uh my caseless twenty two this week. Well Daisy VL weirdo super pellet gun. Nice. I haven't nice. shot it yet, but uh one So of these no days. evidence. You're seeing no evidence, huh? Yeah. Town. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You ever figure out the classification on that thing? No, I need to. You know, I, I, I it's, it's been on my list of things to go. Like, okay, what what kind of what kind of gymnastics did the ATF use to say this is a firearm versus a pellet gun? I've got my suspicions. So I just i I haven't uh, haven't double checked on that because that you know that'd be the shit. Now you could you could you could. It'd be a hell of a lot cheaper than the regular twenty two. Um, so there's no brass or not even a primer, it's just some fucking powder glued to the end of the bullet. Let's go to town. <laughs> Calvin, anything? Oh nope. Uh not really. Just HOA problems? Yes, problems with my HOA. <laughs> what state are you in, Calvin? Confusion. Texas. Oh. You're where in Texas? Dallas. No shit. What are you? No, I'm not there right now. That's where I'm from. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Irving oh. boy. Born and raised. Oh, I drive by there every single day. I'm sorry. No, it's a great state, dude. <laughs> yeah. Next time I'm back home we'll have to link up, dude. Yeah, man, that's cool. There's a I mean, there's a couple other people from Dallas area. Coyon Noir is one of them. Uh, he lives in Dallas. Oh, he uh, does? Yeah. Huh. I have to teach yeah. him how to yeah. break dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't know yeah. if you guys know Ryan Miller. He's a PRS shooter. He's also based out of Dallas. He's the one who made the 308 suck video that everyone hates. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Ethan... Well, Garrity? From, yeah, Ethan Garrity's up there. But he, he's no longer with us because he likes to fly now. Priorities. Yep. Flying is life. Yeah, there's some good people down there, man. That's a good town. Good town. Yeah. 
Oh, it's also a TFB guy here too, uh, Patrick R. He's, I think he's, he's also in the PNS group. He's done some stuff where he's like reference Bill. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I believe he's doing specifically a Roland special series and he's digging it. He's liking that setup. Yeah, yeah. let me shoot his. So. Chad, other than your new uh, optic, anything to, to pimp? Mention, uh, talk about I don't anything directly to pimp. I don't think. Um, I built a new bed since the last time we talked because I broke the old one, and so I had to build a new one last week. But yeah, no training's going jumping. crazy. Yeah, no more jumping on the bed. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've been training a lot. Had a crazy job interview yesterday. So we'll see how that goes, but uh, local work. Um, yeah, that's about it. I have, I have some other things that I can't really talk about right now. Hopefully, I can talk about them in the near future. We'll, we'll do more of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hopefully, I'll be able to, to speak on them. Ray, anything? Yeah. Um, so, like I told you guys before we got uh, live, I've got the uh, project manager from uh, the from Picatinny from the Maneuver Ammunition Systems coming here to Fort Bragg to talk to a team leader and above here on Fort Bragg about the new M855A1 EPR round and the M80A1. Uh, along with 40 millimeter low velocity. So that should be a good discussion um, and good feedback for the for them on what issues we're seeing out there in the force. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has to say and uh, what it is that, uh, what myths he plans on dispelling because he said he was going to be dispelling. It's a, uh, Chuck, you might know him, uh, Kevin O'Connor. I don't know if you're familiar with that yep. name. Yeah, he's coming down yep. now, so. If you happen to be in this neck of the woods and want to talk to him, yeah, just let me know. I'll let you know where it's going to be at. Yeah, when, when's that going to be? Uh, Friday, next Friday, the 2nd of June. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm flying down to uh, flying to Texas on Sunday and then uh, back to the left coast. I won't be back till after June 4th. So. No worries. No worries. Uh, same yeah. thing for you, Mike, um, if you want to come. Does he have ex, uh, does he have existing programs for forty millimeter velo uh, low velocity? Uh, he does. Um, I'm going to be specifically referencing the new door breaching round and uh, the oh, new yeah. training, the new training round uh, that they're planning on using for replacing the uh, uh, existing TP training practice. So basically, what we have got right now is a chalk round um, that. Once it hits with the 40 millimeter low velocity, it just gives a splash of chalk so you know that it's where your impacts are. Well, they've developed one that uh, has a proprietary setup of uh, giving you some form of illumination at night. Uh, I'm not sure exactly whether what they're using, whether it's something similar to uh, a chem light or something like that, or if they've gone another route, but. It's supposed to be maybe able to give you day or night uh, capability. Maybe I have a training a flash around, around, maybe like a like the Mark 19 training flash. No, the Mark Some. 19 flash rounds are fucking dud producing. Um, yeah. they they are they can only be fired into impact area, and uh, the uh, the TPT rounds were designed specifically so you could use them on maneuver live fires and not create gotcha. duds. Gotcha. And, and that's that's a big um, concern that they they wanted to address. Yeah, and I, I'm sure as you guys are trying to go away from lead-free ammo, that gigantic lead slug yeah, behind the slug. chalk <laughs> probably, probably needs to get addressed as well. Um, Actually, there's zinc. Yeah. I know. Just how much I, know. I saw a motherfucker get shot with one, though. Oh, yeah. Fucking negli yeah. negligent nice discharge as a private. Base. It'll do work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was like, wow. <laughs> That's going to leave a mark. I, th I think that private's going to Korea. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's where he went to. Um, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's that's unfortunate that um, that there's not a good a good uh, increased lethality uh, forty millimeter HE requirement out there. I thought for sure 
somebody would have uh, convinced the maneuver center to write a fucking requirement for a piezoelectric fuse and double the double the HE and double the frag in the existing uh, form factor. There, there, there may be out there, Chuck. I'm, I'm not familiar with it as of right now. I'll ask that question though and see if they're my, my very there. first shot show as a staff sergeant. Um, Force mod guy in the Rangers in Orlando in 2000. I had a ballistic research company show me a piezoelectric fucking 40 millimeter round that had a 10 millimeter fucking lethal radius. That was in 2000. You mean 10 meters? 10 10 meter. Yeah, you said double, double. Sorry, 10 10 meters. Yeah. Okay. Double the uh, double the. Uh, effective range yeah that's yeah that's awesome. um and it, it was it was a simple matter of getting rid of the fusing system in the current round which w- is horrible wing nut on this on a screw mm-hmm. yep yeah the gyro stabilized super thingy with the rubber bands which takes up all that room if you just remove that first off you're going to get less duds than we have now if it's piezoelectric and it does fucking hit the ground It'll be inert, basically, so you don't have to worry about fucking kicking an armed 40 mic mic and having it go off. Um, and then because the piezoelectric fuse head is smaller than that gyro-stabilized bullshit, you can cram more frag and more boom in the exact same footprint. So, and I believe the vendor when they told me that. Oh, yeah. I absolutely believe that the company involved, they were doing some pretty, pretty awesome stuff. Um, so I've been waiting patiently no, no. 17 years for the army to make a better 203 round. And then I just said, fuck you army and quit carrying a 203. Well, the problem is they went the whole XM 25 route and they, they went down that rabbit hole with the counter defilade fire. I know, I know. And, um, that right there in and of itself was uh, a distraction from what you're getting at. But now they're they're finally back on 40 millimeter because they realize if we're going to do counter defilade, let's do it right and just use the Carl Beer stuff. So thankfully wow. myself and uh, thankfully myself and Paul Meacham from the 101st, I think had a big, uh, big impact on that one and said, no, we don't want the XM 25. <laughs> <laughs> Give us more mortars, <laughs> dude. Fuck. I was at I was at NDIA in Vegas, and uh, a bunch of people are all swooning over the fucking twenty five and all this other bullshit. And I think I think XM eight might have been out there too. And, uh, I start going <laughs> off about the fucking. I start going off about the, the XM twenty five. I was like, yeah, this thing's so fucking awesome. It blew a tester's arm off at Aberdeen. And little did I know the program managers behind the uh behind the, the table. Uh we'll go ahead and say we'll go ahead and say her name rhymes with Barbara. Uh so <laughs> so she's like, I was there on the range that day. It totally didn't blow his arm off. And I was <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry, it was hanging by some tendons and shit. And she's like, that was a coworker of mine. And I'm like, wow, you should feel twice as shitty for yourself at this point. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, am, I am the non-commissioned officer that told the program manager of fucking XM25 that she was a piece of shit for blowing her fucking buddy's arm off with the OICW in 1997. Pepper's <laughs> Farms remembers that. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the plot line to Rebo Williams, dude. That is the <laughs> plot line to Rebo Williams. Holy shit. Hey, Jordan. Oh, God. Joe gets blown up yeah. by a bull pup. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But Starship Troopers. And Starship Troopers, man. That's two of the greatest works of art of all time. Ever. So, Jordan, what you got? Anything oh. that you need to promote? No, not really. Anything nice to say to Chad? I guess. <laughs> nice hat, dude. Yeah, I just got that today. I was stoked on it. Yeah, you need to get yeah. some stains on it. The uh, 
outdoor research and these flex fit one tens are pretty much the uh the only things I can count on to fit my head. So uh I was pretty happy to get to see those them doing more of those. That so one pull just pick up the slack so I could be have all that cool shit and you know not look like some yamaka on my head and that'd be sweet. <laughs> In time, I'm sure. Mike? Uh, no change over the last one. Appreciate you having me back. Yeah, thanks for being on. And finally, Chuck. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> anything you want to... Going to Texas, going to be... Hanging out with Going to be going to Fort Hood with some... Some SWAT guys doing some SWAT stuff. And uh, then I'm going back to the PNW, checking in at my house. Um, my kids graduate high school. Well, my two oldest boys graduate high school on the 10th. So I'll be back down here for that. Uh and then I'm going to take the brand new car and i uh, got to drive it back to the left coast. So stay tuned for Facebook updates of the epic country road trip. I'm sure it'll be awesome. At least you won't have any uh, <laughs> updates about pre-check. Yeah, it's going to be me. It's going to be doggo and I roll it, rolling dirty westward. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, and, and for I, anyone that's not familiar. Yeah. I'm sorry, and I want to state for the record, since we were talking about Pat Rogers, little Irish fuck, uh, the, uh, my first piston gun, <laughs> 1995, I got to 75th Ranger Regiment to be a pre-ranger instructor, and I start going through their arms room, digging around, they had all these fucking guns, they seized in Panama, and I found an AR-180 in that bitch, and I put a fucking blank adapter on it, and got a ski mask with three holes in it, and ran around playing Irish Republican Army Op 4 against the pre-ranger students by this badass 180. It was fucking legit. But then it quit working. Fucking piston guns, whatever. So, um, <laughs> and I, could, I couldn't understand how to make it work. The, the technology was way beyond me. It was like alien artifacts and shit. So <laughs> I spent $550 on the company credit card to get six HKG3 mags and a G3 blank adapter and combo tool and started rocking this G3 with uh, green plastic handguards that we got from Noriega's hooker or something. I don't know. And so, uh, but yeah, thank you, HK. $550 for <laughs> six mags and a fucking blank adapter. But man, that thing could chuck fucking 762 blank rounds like 20 feet. Like I could shoot at a private and hit another private off my 3 o'clock. It's fucking legit. I think I legitimately fucking caused permanent hearing loss to some of those kids too. It was awesome. I think had like a three foot fucking blast flame coming out of the front. It was awesome. It's amazing. So from your from your Panamanian Defense Force arms room to my fucking Op 4 fucking arms room. Piston guns. That's what's up. Hey, Chuck. <laughs> Funny how that all just came back. Full circle. Yeah. Call back. You punch it. Um, nope. Oh, Ray, I think you just lost your signal. Ah, crap. Oh, I can hear you now. All right, now we can hear you. All right, yeah. And no longer. Balls. <laughs> Internet at Fort Bragg is bullshit. <laughs> oh, we're in the porn hour. He, he's competing with 16,000 Joes trying to get their U porn on. <laughs> All right. Let's try this again. You got me? I can hear yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Five so, by five. Hey, Chuck, are you planning on doing any work with the DA security guards over there at Womack? No. Did you see that debacle at Robinson? Oh, I, I did. It was amazing. I don't understand how they can be so jacked up and have so many resources on one location. It's it's pretty awesome. Yeah. It, why they felt like they needed to put that video of all videos up on the internet. I don't know. I Whoever's in charge of 
like PR and, and doing all that, they always grab the wrong shit. I've seen seventh group and third groups um, like assaulter marksmanship competition fucking videos posted on their group fucking web pages and our Facebook pages, and they were like the shittiest run all day. It's like t- it's like take your three gun bloopers, but then like try to play it off as like for serious. Here's assaulters from Seven Special Forces Group. You know, at some Puerto Rican throwing his fucking mags over his head and shit, doing combat <laughs> rolls, slapping himself in the ass with the hot mops. Like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you know, oh, great, great recruit, great recruiting tool, fellas. You know. God damn. <laughs> well, I think that does it. Thanks guys for being on. Um we we have a website. If you look at primaryandsecondary.com, you can find our our website. We have a forum at primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. Uh big thanks to Nighthawk. They happen to be our site sponsor or the the uh podcast sponsor I'm still digging that that 1911 I have um, if you like what you heard if you appreciate our work feel free to check out our patreon page at patreon.com slash primary and secondary um, we appreciate any donations that are provided also you can find all of our videos and our uh, we're also on audio only podcasts you can find us on video on YouTube. We are on the audio side is on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play. Feel free to share, subscribe, like, give us some feedback. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. These have been a blast. I've, I've really enjoyed these. Uh, and this was our 100th episode. I hope we continue and, and have just, as much, just the same amount, if not more fun with these, because these just get better and better. Um, I believe... Uh, Scott's doing one on, I think it's Sunday. He has a, he has a really good panel and it's pretty much going to be about combatives. So I think I covered everything I need to say. So yeah, spread the word, like share all that other stuff. This specific uh, feed is going to be cut and then edited. And then there will be a new, uh, a new link put out. So I'll be taking this one down just for editing. So that's all. I will talk to you guys later.